As Mother Nature continues to wreak havoc on the New England sports slate, Monin Park in Boston, Massachusetts is the setting for this rescheduled affair between the Suffolk University Rams and your UMass Boston Beacons. That's up next right here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Good evening and welcome to the BBN. Along with Steve Consiglio, I am John Scudris. Tonight, the Beacons get set to take on a familiar foe, the Rams of Suffolk U. Less than two weeks ago, UMass took the first of a doubleheader against these Rams, 6-5 in walk-off fashion. Despite trailing 5-2 in the sixth inning, Brendan Igebrot's club reeled off four unanswered runs, including a walk-off double by senior Anthony Searles en route to the triumph in the opener of that afternoon's twin bill. Unfortunately, the skies would open up soon thereafter to delaying a potential sweep of the Rams until tonight. In that matchup, Dan Mantoni started and gave up two earned runs in five and two-thirds innings. However, the real star was Matt Tully. The reliever tossed three and a third scoreless to close out the ball game, recording his first victory of 2017. On Monday, the Beacons did experience a sweet taste of success against Worcester State. UMass rode the right arm of Joe McGuire and the red-hot bat of Chris Fowler, who went three for five with two driven in in a 7-3 victory. The win moved UMass to 10-5 on the season and set them up for continued success as they inch closer to the critical final month of the season. And at this point, I will turn to my partner in crime, Steve Consiglio. And Steve, on Monday, a big victory for the Beacons over Worcester State, but from what I spoke to you off the air, it doesn't seem like Coach Igerboat was all that enthused. No, I mean... Uh, the Beacons didn't really come through and men on, on third in less than two outs. You know, you got to get that run in every time, put the ball in play, get that run home, get up another run. Even though they, they scored seven runs that game, but they could have easily um, scored 10 to 15 if they really, you know, swung the bats the right way and, and really made uh, successful outs. You know, move the runners and um, steal bases when they need to. Yeah, it's all building block, and they're certainly putting together a nice beginning to the season already with 10 wins on the campaign. Tonight they will turn to the young right-hander Fernando Burgos, and Burgos has been outstanding since coming to Beaconville at the beginning of last season. Can you give us a, a scouting report on what we should expect tonight from Fernando Burgos? Burgos really lives down in the zone, fastball changeup, curve slider. You know, he can, he can locate everything for a strike, and he was probably one of the most successful pitchers last year coming out of nowhere. And he was, he was just huge. He, he came through in big games. And he shut down good teams. Let's just see, hope he can keep the ball down the zone to this free-swinging Suffolk team. It's the Beacons and the Rams, and it's up next right here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Let's take a look now at the all-time series matchup between these two rivals. They've played a plethora of times over the last 20 to 30 years. And as you see on your screen, Suffolk has dominated the majority of those affairs, winning 23 out of 34 over the lifetime of this rivalry. This is the third meeting over the last two years, and the last Suffolk win came a year ago on March 27th, a 7-3 triumph. Of course, we already highlighted the 6-5 victory on March 25th for the Beacons, led by Anthony Searles' walk-off double. These teams actually met at least every other year from 1983 to 2011 before taking a break for five years from 2011 to last year. Suffolk won 11 of the first 13 matchups. However, the Beacons have gone 8-12 and 12 since. An oddity, these teams have played really almost every other year since 1983. This is the first home series, first home games, that UMass Boston has had against the Rams since 1996. Steve, were you alive in 1996? I was. Just a wee little Three spell. years old. There you go. Hey, you're older than I thought you might have yeah. been. Uh, right now, the Beacons, though, looking to bounce back from what was a, uh, a tough, tough matchup on Monday. They did win the game, but as Steve gave us insight into, Coach Agarbrot wants to see more from his entire roster of players. Let's take a look now at the four things to know heading into this evening's affair. And uh, right now, both teams are coming off, of course, last year's spectacular runs to the NCAA tournament. UMass Boston has played five games, Suffolk two since March 25th. We'll see if that has some sort of an effect. And the Beacons, of course, won six of seven after the win over Worcester State on Monday. This is the first game for Suffolk since last Wednesday, so in a week. So what do you think benefits more, the team that's played a lot over the last week or the team that's had all that time off? Being this uh, a weekday game, it's not your 1-2 usually pitching. So in this affair, um, the Beacons will uh, have the advantage, seeing they, they swung the bats. They saw live pitching on Monday. They've been swinging pretty hot bats relatively. And their bullpens, it's not really worn out because they only had Joe McGuire and 
a few other guys go in that game, they, and they could easily ba ba bounce back in two days. I mean, they got Burgos expected to go six or seven innings. They really just need one or two guys right behind him. Even though Suffolk's got a fresh bullpen with all their guys, I think the Beacons have the uh, home, hometown advantage. Well, we certainly hope that that prognostication comes to fruition. Let's take a look now at the player to watch. This evening, it is the starting second baseman for your UMass Boston Beacons, Josh Lopez. Josh had a nice game a couple of days ago on Monday in that win over Worcester State. For the campaign, Josh is hitting 306 with six runs driven in, which uh, is uh, harken back to his freshman year, where he won Rookie of the Year with UMass Boston, did Josh Lopez. He had a bit of a slump in his sophomore campaign, but he's come back with a vengeance here this year, and certainly he provides some pop at the bottom of the order that the Beacons were sorely lacking last season. Let's take a look now at the highlights here on the pregame show. The Beacons match up against the Suffolk Rams from two weeks ago. That game one of the doubleheader that we will conclude tonight. That's right next on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Three two pitch, swung on and missed, got him on the fist. And Dan Mantoni works himself back from a 3 0 count to pick up a leadoff strikeout. Antoni's not really a pitcher, he's just an athlete. He's got quick feet. Runner takes off to throw into second. Riley, the tag, and the Beacons get him. Chip game, dying their hair just like most of the island of Puerto Rico. 2 1 pitch. Both runners take off the throw to second. It's high, and the Beacons complete the double steal. 3 1 pitch here to Lopez, a high chopper. That's going to score a run. The shortstop, Cameron, bobbling it, and the Beacons will get a run. 0-1 pitch to him, grounded right up the middle, that one has eyes, the shortstop Cameron comes across, but it's enough to score the runner, the Beacons with two runs in the inning, as Rogers maybe a bit unfortunate not to pick up the infield single, 2-1 pitch to Tyrone, that ball's hit out to left field, Herzog going back on it, this ball will die right in front of the warning track, and man, Tony works around the bases loaded with one down to strand three, we found to a catcher. 1-2, that one's ripped out to left field. Herzog's not going to get there. That one bounces right in front of the fence out there in left center. Prashino's throw to second. It's going to be close, but it didn't quite get there in time. A nice slide from Coyley, who has the one-out double. 0-1 oh, pitch to Jerome with the bases loaded. Hits it over to second. Lopez's only play is the first. The run will come home, and it's tied 2-2. Two two. He comes in a tough spot here with the runner on second and immediately gives up a hard single down the left field side. That's going to score a run, and Brady Chant 0 for 3 against Dan Mantoni. 1 for 1 against Matt Tully, and the Meekins deficit all of a sudden is 5-2. to two. Walrod tried to get the runner in third. Murphy flares it out to right field. This one might get down. The right fielder is going to make the diving effort. It'll go as a sacrifice fly with the two lead runners moving up. 1-1 one, one pitch. Bounces through, and that one's going to get back to the stop. Hugie with a good jump to begin with, and it's a wild pitch to cut the deficit to 5-4. And the 0-2 pitch on the outside corner. Strike three. Tully gets out of the jam. A 1-0 pitch, and McCormick hits that one out to left field. Going back on his Grogan once again. Not going to make the play. McCormick, a pitch hit, RBI double, and we're tied at 5-5. Brendan Igerro did not want that man bunny. He can certainly hoping to get back into the dugout quickly. Swung on and missed a half-hearted swing. Searles applies the tag. Five strikeouts in three and a third innings for Matt Tully. Could just Runners on the pair of walks to start the bottom of the ninth inning. And Searles is swinging that ball's hit deep ball. out the center. Rush. Over the head of Chance, and the Beacons are going to win it. Danielson rounds third base, and Anthony Searles is first hit in a while, and it's a walk off RBI double. And UMass Boston wins 6 to 5, coming back from a 5 2 deficit, and Searles is mobbed at the second base bag. What a way to break a drought. You love to see that. Searles has been. You know, in that drought, as you're saying, but he's been hitting, squaring a few balls up here and there, and that one finally falls in over the center fielder's head. The power we were talking about earlier today.
The UMass Boston Beacons get set to take on the Suffolk University Rams right here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Let's take a look now at the starting lineup for the visiting team, those Suffolk U Rams. On your screen there, leading off, playing center field, it'll be Brady Chan. Batting second, the shortstop, Sean Cameron. Hitting over 400 on the campaign is Seth Coyley. He hits third and plays left. The cleanup hitter is the backstop, Matt Brenner. The designated hitter is Greg Speliotis. He will bat fifth. The six-hole hitter is the right fielder, Luke Ronke. The first baseman is Kevin Belsky. He will hit seventh. The eight-hole hitter is the third baseman, Curtis Tyrone. And the nine-hole hitter, bringing up the rear, is Kevin Higgins, your second baseman. They will oppose this defensive lineup for UMass Boston. As you see here on your screen, the Beacons countering with the same exact lineup they had on Monday. Herzog in center, in, excuse me, in right and center, Sal Fraschino in left field, Ryan McCormick from left to right on the infield, Boudreaux. Hugi, Lopez, and Fowler, and the battery mates, Anthony Searles, will be catching for Fernando Burgos, the starting pitcher for UMass Boston this evening. And Fernando, as uh, my partner in crime, Steve Consiglio, mentioned, he's a player who really delivers when it is his time to toe the rubber. You see there, three starts, four appearances, a 2-0 record, and a 4.95 ERA in 20 innings of work. He struck out 19. You'd like to see the 12 walks come down a little bit, but his power is no mystery. 19 strikeouts in 20 innings. He knows how to bring it. Meanwhile, the leadoff hitter is set to go, and it will be Brady Chant. Chant on the campaign, 327, one home run, nine RBIs. Native of Warwick, Rhode Island, standing at 6'3", 180 pounds. Chant on the year. This will be his 12th start. 17 of 52. Does have a home run. Along with uh, four doubles and two triples. So he's a player who knows how to get the rally started. Along with Steve Consiglio, I am John Scudras. This is... Beacons Baseball on the Beacons Broadcasting Network, a rescheduled game from March 25th, part of a doubleheader that the Beacons won the opener 6-5 on a walk-off double from Anthony Searles. First batter is Brady Chan. He takes this one low for ball one. It's 1-0 and to the Rams center fielder. From the windup, Burgos is 1-0 pitch. That one's ripped to center field. On his horse and moving back is Sal Fraschino, and he cannot get there. Got a bad jump, misjudged it, and Chant's going to try for a leadoff triple. Overthrowing the cutoff man was Fraschino, and utilizing that to his advantage is Chant as he motors into third with a leadoff triple to start the ball game. Yeah, it's not what you want to see from the Beacons to start the game. Sal got a tough jump, and, uh, you know, Burgos kind of left the fastball up, but at the same time, you know, you just got to get outs, you know. Don't worry about that guy on third base and just collect your outs in this situation. Sean Cameron will be the number two hitter. The shortstop's hitting 324 with no bombs and six RBIs, but he's got a golden opportunity for his seven. If he hits it anywhere but third base where Kyle Boudreaux is near the bag. First pitch was down and in for a ball. It's 1-0 and as Burgos falls behind another hitter. One ball and no strikes. Out of the stretch here with a man at third. Burgos sees this one lifted left center field. That should get the run home. Sal had to catch it moving to his right. Hurls this one in, but it will not be in time. Good throw nonetheless. As it's a sacrifice fly to left center field for Sean Cameron. RBI number seven on the year for the shortstop for the Rams. And it's an early 1-0 lead for Suffolk University. The left fielder number 10, Seth Coyley. It's just what the doctor ordered after the leadoff triple. Makes some contact, and that brings up Seth Coyley. <coughs> Coyley hitting over 400 on the year. The only ram to do that as he's at 407. No homers, four RBIs as he takes one right down Broadway for a strike. Coyley, this will be his eighth start. He's got four doubles as part of an 11-hit performance and 27 at-bats as he takes it down and in for a ball, one and one. Burgos from the windup, the 1-1 pitch, and that's an off-speed pitch breaking away and missing away. Two balls and one strike. Yeah. 
The 2-1 here from Fernando Burgos. Chopped towards the opposite way. Gobbled up at second by Lopez. Easy play at first to Fowler. And that is a 4-3 put out for the second out of the inning. So Fernando settling down a bit after the leadoff triple. And that will bring up the cleanup hitter, Matt Brenner. The catcher, number seven, Matt Brenner. Brenner, the backstop this evening, hitting 220 with four driven in. Burgos trying to get out of the first inning with just the one run allowed. After the leadoff triple by Brady Chant, as that one is right down Broadway with a fastball, it's nothing in one. Lopez, a native of... Shelton, excuse me, New Haven, Connecticut was our player to watch, and he just made that play moments ago as Fernando misses on that. It's one and one now to Matt Brenner. Breaking ball away. Two balls and one strike to the Rams backstop. Greg Speliotis is on deck should Brenner reach base. The Hyde Park, Massachusetts native winds and delivers a beautiful breaking ball as that cut right over the inside corner. And it's two and two. From the windup, the 2-2 two -two is outside with a fastball, and the count is now full. Three balls and two strikes. This is why you see that Burgos had that 12 walks on the season. He's just got to go right after him and not get to these deep counts. Especially with two outs and no one on. And a batter hitting 220 in the batter's box. Here's the 3-2 pitch. That one cued a jam shot towards second. Our player to watch, Josh Lopez, flings it over to Fowler at first, and that will retire the side. So we are through one half inning here from Monin Park in Boston, Massachusetts. A leadoff triple from Brady Chant brings home the first run. It's one run on one hit with no errors. We head to the bottom of the first inning. It's 1-0 Rams on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. I'm the first undergraduate alumnus to uh, lead this university. I'm very proud of that. I was literally able to transform my life because of the University of Massachusetts, and I want that for every single student that walks through the door. So UMass Boston trailing one nothing after one half inning will look to come back out here and deliver with the sticks as they will face off against number 17, Ryan Portis. Uh, before we do take a look at Portis, let's take a quick peek at the Beacon starting lineup. As uh, this is uh, Brendan Igerbrot bringing out the same lineup the Beacons had on Monday. Leading off and playing right field, Nick Herzog. The shortstop is Charlie Hughey. He bats second. Designated hitter, Dan Mantoni hitting third. Kyle Boudris is the third baseman. He's in the cleanup spot. Chris Fowler has been scorching hot, including two ribbies on Monday. He bats fifth. Ryan McCormick bats sixth. He's in left field. The seven-hole hitter is Anthony Searles. He's behind the plate and hitting eighth. Uh, it's Alfreshino is in center field, and then Josh Lopez brings up the rear player to watch, hitting over 300 on the campaign. They will face off against Ryan Portis, a right-hander and junior out of Hawthorne, California, standing at 6'2", 190 pounds. Portis, a far way from home here at Suffolk University, but he has performed admirably for the Rams since coming on over to Boston as you take a look at Portis on your screen. Portis 1-0 in three appearances, a 3.79 ERA. He's given up 22 hits in 19 innings to go along with eight earned runs, striking out nine and walking four. So Ryan Portis, he's faced the most batters of anybody on this Suffolk pitching staff, and we'll see if uh, his experience can lend himself some success on what has become a chilly night here in Boston. And Steve... The Beacons offense, you mentioned, they'd like to see a little bit more than they saw on Monday. What's their approach got to be today against the Rams? I think they're going to be pretty aggressive, John. You know, it's not really their top top arm from Suffolk, so they, they want to get to the bullpen as soon as they can. And every uh, every fastball that he throws, they're going to they're going to attack big time. 
We hope to see plenty of hits this evening for the Beacons on a chilly night, and Nick Herzog will be the one to kick it off. The right fielder's leading off and hitting 283. he He's got one home run and 13 driven in. From the windup, and the first pitch from Portis is off the inside corner, 1-0. Portis, a six foot two inch right hander from the Golden Coast. He delivers a 1 0 pitch, and that one's cued foul up the third baseline, 1 and 1. Terzog, Hugie, and Mantoni. Anybody reaches Kyle Boudris will step in. Beacons have won six out of their last seven, including a victory on March 25th against these Rams. Portis from the windup. 1-1, one, one, check swing, but right down Broadway for a strike with a curveball, and a nice one at that. It's 1-2. and two. Herzog crowds the plate from the right side. He's back in. The 1-2 pitch, another curveball, and this one's rip foul. Getting out in front of that one was the Beacon's right fielder. It stays 1-2. Get to the outfield alignment after this pitch for the Suffolk Rams. As Portis is ready, the 1-2 pitch. Another curveball and a dandy of one as he pulls the strings on Nick Herzog to retire the Beacons' leadoff hitter on strikes. Yeah, that curveball really buckled Nick's knees in that situation. A beautiful hook from Ryan Portis, and that'll bring up Charlie Hugie. The outfield alignment for those Rams from right to left in the outfield. Luke Ronsky is in right. The center fielder is Brady Chen, the left fielder Seth Coyley. On the infield from right to left, Kevin Belsky's at first, Kevin Higgins is at second, the shortstop is Sean Cameron, and the third baseman is Curtis Tyrone, as this one is a little bit low to Hugie, it's 1-0. The battery mates Matt Brenner and Ryan Portis. The women's softball team played a doubleheader against the Panthers of Plymouth State just across the road earlier as a 1-0 pitch a foul tip into the plate. It's one and one. Beacon split the doubleheader. A 3-0 loss to the Panthers along with a 4-3 triumph. Beacons will try to avoid a split of a de facto doubleheader with a victory tonight. They would sweep the doubleheader that began on March 25th, 11 days ago. There's a 1-1. That one is Riff foul out of play. Heading up the first baseline. One ball and two strikes to Charlie Hugie. Hugie's got to look out, the, look out for that curveball in the dirt right here. He has buried a couple of hooks so far here in the first inning. Portis gets his sign. The one-two pitch. Another curveball. That's inside. Good eye. Knew exactly what he was trying to do on that one. Beacons looking to improve to 11 and 5 as the 2 2 pitch is in the dirt. And on that one, Hugie showed another good eye. It's coming back from the curveball, coming back to some hard stuff, and leads the count to 3 and 2. Dan Mantoni's on deck. He had a bit of a tough go of it at the plate on Monday, a rarity for Dan. See if he can bounce back this evening. Portis from the windup. The 3-2 pitch. Another curveball on the inside corner. Called strike three. Struck him out. So a couple of strikeouts looking on the curveball to begin this one. And Steve, you didn't like that. Yeah, Hugie wasn't happy with that one either. It looked like an inside curveball. And the catcher was set up on the other side of the plate. And kind of brought it back with the glove. And the ump gave him the call. Usually you don't see that if it's not hitting the placement where the catcher lines up. But on this night, not so, as Dan Mantoni steps in. A couple of strikeouts to begin the game for Ryan Portis as he misses away with a fastball to Dan. Mantoni hitting 286, one bomb, 12 runs batted in this year. There's the 1 0. 
That one's chopped up the third base line. Tough play and out of the reach of the third baseman as Turtis Tyrone was diving towards the line. That'll be at least a single, and Mantoni's in trouble. Gets in there. Gets the right foot in right in front of the tag of the second baseman, Kevin Higgins. And a beautiful piece of hitting, an even better slide to reach second for Dan Mantoni. Yeah, Dan's not what you call a speedster, and he was able to get the second on that one. I'd like to see a relay from the shortstop because that, that ball just didn't really get there. didn't have enough on it from the left fielder. With a man at second and two outs now, a meeting between Matt Brenner, the catcher, and Ryan Portis to see how they want to deal with Fowler. They may, or excuse me, with Boudreaux. I'd say they may uh, have put him on, but with the way Fowler's been hitting so far and already being two outs, doesn't seem much of reason to do that. No, I don't think they'll put him on, but they got to be careful because Boudreaux is one of the best hitters with runners in scoring position over the past year and a half. Kyle's hitting 316 overall this year with seven driven in. Third baseman with that wide open stance from the left side. For the first time out of the stretch, Portis looking for his sign from Brenner. And Boudreaux tires of waiting and steps out. Kyle is sophomore from Medford, Massachusetts. Went to Arlington Catholic High School. First pitch to Kyle, and he takes a hack at that one, sends it in the air to left field. Moving to his left, and then in his tracks is Seth Coyley to make the play, and that will retire the side. So Boudreaux goes hacking at the first pitch he sees from Portis and is retired to end the inning. No runs on one hit, one man left on base. We are through one inning from Monin Park. It's one nothing Rams on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. I did receive a non-athletic scholarship upon entering uh, school. I got the presidential scholarship, which was huge for me. I think there's more opportunities for academic scholarships in Division Three. I did receive academic scholarships. Just being involved on campus, being a leader, all those things combined kind of get me recognized. It's a great experience for me. Greg Speliotis will lead things off here in the second inning. It's 1-0 Rams on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Let's take a look at how as Brady Chant led off that first inning with this beautiful shot to center field. Sal Fraschino got on his horse but was unable to catch up to it. It was a leadoff triple for Brady. And because of that, following a uh, sacrifice fly to center field from Sean Cameron later in the inning, it's 1-0 Suffolk Rams here on the BBN. Joe Burgos back on the mound as he will tow the rubber for his second inning of work against 5, 6, and 7, Greg Speliotis, Luke Ronke, and Kevin Belsky. Speliotis, the designated hitter, hitting 250 with two driven in. But, Steve, I think Fernando did a pretty good job settling down after that initial triple to get out of the inning without any further damage. Yeah, once he was back in the windup, he didn't really... Have to really think about it, almost like a new game. You know, he's just moving on from that, and hopefully he stays down in the zone from here on out. Leading off for Suffolk in the top of the second inning, the designated hitter, number 22, Greg Speliotis. Speliotis steps in from the right side, the DH, and native of Salem, Massachusetts, is in and ready. Burgos gets the sign from Searles. First pitch to... The designated hitter is an off-speed pitch for a strike, nothing in one. This is not the first time this game we've seen Fernando attack them backwards with a breaking ball to start the at-bat, coming back with a fastball low, one and one. Yeah, Burgos can do that because he's got such good command of his off-speed, especially that curveball. He can just flip it in for a strike whenever he needs to. Here's a 1-1, one, one, comes back with a fastball inside. Two balls and one strike to Greg Speliotis. It's a Suffolk team with mostly New England-born players on their roster, though they do have two Californians. As that one is right down Broadway for a strike two and two, that would be Ryan Portis and Wyatt Stanley, a couple of pitchers. Here's the 2-2. Two -two. Curveball, and this one's chopped towards shortstop. Hugie's going to have to hurry, but Peliotis doesn't run all that well, and he's gunned down 6-3. That's one down to begin the second inning. Bring up Luke Ronke. Ronke on the year hitting 326, one home run and nine driven in. A right fielder by trade. The right fielder, number five. 
five, Luke Ronke. And a native of Randolph, New Jersey. First pitch to Luke is right down Broadway, nothing at one. Working quickly now is Fernando, and that one is swung on and missed with a nice fastball, nothing in two. Yeah, his two-seam fastball moves so much that it's not easy to get a barrel on there, John. Ronke missed on that one. He is one of the team's leading hitters at 326, certainly among qualifiers, as the 0-2 pitch is just a bit low, an off-speed pitch. One and two. Ronke, in fact, second on the team in slugging among players with at least 30 at-bats. Here's the one-two pitch from Burgos. Another breaking ball as that one dips low. Two balls and two strikes. To Ronke, who is the right fielder, batting sixth in this lineup. From the windup, the 2-2 two -two pitch. Another curveball got him to go around, and that's the first strikeout of the evening for Fernando Burgos, two down here in inning number two. That'll bring up Kevin Belsky, the first baseman, hitting 318. He's got a bomb and six runs driven in this year. Burgos facing the left-handed hitter. A nice fastball that's cut on and missed by Belsky. Some high heat to pull the lefty. And I think that was that two-seamer you were talking about. It's got a lot of movement. Oh, yeah. Moves like two, three inches, which is a lot for a fastball. Comes right back with a nice breaking ball, but just missed low. Looked pretty good from here. Fernando seems to have found his command here in this second inning after a bit of a rocky start, as that one is the two-seamer that just cuts outside, two and one. Two-one pitch from Burgos out of the windup, and that's on the outside corner. Looked in the same place as the last one, but we'll take it. It's now Deuces Wild, two-two with two outs here in inning number two. Burgos, the 2-2 pitch. That one cued the opposite way. Hughie's going to have to make a strong throw from deep in left field, and he just short hops Fowler, who can't scoop it. And that'll be an infield single for Kevin Belsky. Good effort all around, unfortunately just for naught, as Belsky's able to get in at first base with two down, and that'll bring up Tyrone. Curtis, the third baseman, hitting 167, no home runs and three driven in. The third baseman, number one, of Curtis Tyrone. Tyrone, a native of Waltham, standing 5'10", 170, and a sophomore. Went to Catholic Memorial High. It's off the outside corner with a fastball. <laughs> one ball and no strikes to Tyrone. Runner at first base is Belsky. Does not have good wheels. Here's the breaking ball right down the heart of Broadway. One and one to the eight-hole hitter, Curtis Tyrone. Beacons trailing one to nothing here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Along with Steve Consiglio, I'm John Scudris. One-one pitch from Burgos. Misses up and away. Two balls and one strike. Just seems like Burgos doesn't have that outstanding command of the fastball tonight. He's commanded his off-speed stuff pretty well so far, but as you said, the fastball has been a bit erratic. It is still early, and it is a cold night, so we'll see if maybe once he warms up a little bit more, he can command that a little bit better. Here's a 2-1. Like you said, misses low with a fastball, and now it's three balls in one strike with Kevin Higgins on deck. Not much wind, the flags in right center field blowing, but not to any sort of extreme. Here's a 3-1, nice fastball up and away as he gets the shortstop to swing through this one. And it's three balls and two strikes now with the man at first, so that means Belsky will be off with the pitch. Got to be careful, though, because Burgos has a real good pickoff move. 
Fernando gets his sign, comes home. There goes Belsky, and he misses high with a fastball, and that's ball four. So the first walk of the game for Burgos, and that puts two runners on with two outs for the nine-hole hitter, Kevin Higgins. Higgins, second baseman by trade, hitting 212 with five driven in. This will be his 34th at bat on the campaign. Just a 257 on base percentage, worst on the team, as this one is ripped into shallow left. In fact, it dies in midair and is gobbled up at shortstop by Charlie Hughie. So Burgos tiptoes his way out of trouble. He allows no runs on one hit and strands two runners on base. We are through one and a half here from Monin Park. It's one nothing Rams on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Cheer for the stumbles. The heat should have had that. And the tears that linger. For in those moments, greatness lies. There, you will find the provoked, the determined, the unified. It's in those moments that champions are born. Ryan Portis back on the rubber after a relatively uneventful top bottom half of the first inning. He'll come back out here for the second with a 1-0 lead. Along with Steve Consiglio, I'm John Scudris, the UMass Boston Beacons Broadcasting Network. Suffolk getting that first run on a leadoff triple from Brady Chant, followed by a sacrifice fly by Sean Cameron. Beacons will send out their best hitter so far this year, Chris Fowler, to lead off this inning followed by Ryan McCormick and Anthony Searles. Anyone reaches, we'll see Sal Fraschino step into the left-handed batter's box. And Steve, Chris Fowler, who's hitting 354, a couple of bombs, 12 RBIs. His success at the plate has been so critical, especially over the past week. He had a couple of home runs in their doubleheader on Sunday. He then comes out on Monday and drives in the first two runs of the game and gets the Beacons rolling. What have you seen from Fowler that really shows how much he's progressed as a hitter this season? Well, Fowler's in a power spot of the lineup, so most pitchers are trying to keep the ball down for him, so a fastball low or change up low. Little do they know that Fowler's hot zone is the low part of the strike zone. He loves hitting the ball when it's below his waist and further, and he can put the ball in the left center, right center gas with ease. We saw that on Monday with the... Double in the first inning when he drove in two runs. A line drive double to right center field into that power alley in the 420 mark in right center. He's behind one, zero and one, excuse me, as the curveball is ripped into left field. This one's going to hit the seats and go out of play. But he's behind nothing and two against Ryan Portis. After Fowler, it is Ryan McCormick. Anthony Searles in the hole. Port is working from the windup, the 0-2 pitch. Fastball and a beautiful two-seamer cutting away as that gets Fowler way out in front of that and the first pitcher in a while to make Chris look silly. It's the third strikeout in the first five batters, and it brings up Ryan McCormick with one down in the second. The left fielder, number 16, Ryan McCormick. McCormick, a left fielder hitting 316, has five driven in. And the first pitch to Ryan is down and away, 1-0. Beacons were 15 and 9 a year ago at home. They picked up where they've left off. Very successful here at Monin Park since it opened at the beginning of 2016 as that fastball carves the outside corner 1 and 1. Ryan McCormick sees Portis deliver a 1 1. He went around on the check swing. It's one ball and two strikes. Now, I don't think he went around there. That's where you wish you had four umpires in the D3 level, but if he checked, I think he didn't go. Well, we saw on Monday that there was a very bang-bang play at first base, a double play that this one-two pitch is a curveball low, that the second base umpire said he was safe, even though he was clearly out. And this was the Beacons' 
on defense, but the own plate umpire, who had a better view of it from the first base line, overruled him. Which is something you don't see very often in this sport, but when the call is right, the call is right. Here's a 2-2. Two -two. That one's right on the inside corner for strike three. So cruising here through the first six hitters is the right-hander, Ryan Portis, as he now has four strikeouts, including three looking through the first six he faces. Beacons must, must not be able to pick up the baseball because four Ks in two innings is just unacceptable. The catcher, number 13, Anthony Searles. Beacons, of course, doing all this this year now without Dave Murphy, who is expected to be out for the remainder of the season with an injury. A big loss, part of the Killer M duo, along with Dan Mantoni, that was so successful and so powerful last year. Beacons having to do it without Dave the rest of the campaign. Behind nothing and one is Anthony Searles, another player who had much more success at the dish a year ago, hitting just 167 with six driven in as the 0-1 pitch from Portis is right down Broadway for strike two, nothing and two. Of course, Anthony did have a walk-off double against Suffolk back in that doubleheader game one. From the windup, the 0-2 pitch, curveball away, one ball and two strikes, good eye from Searles. Searles got to look out for a fastball up here. He's got to lay off the ball and, and be aware if it's in the strike zone. Well, Portis had. This here's a 1-2 pitch. Swung on and missed. He struck him out as this one is gobbled up by Brenner to retire the side. Portis coming into the day. I mean, he's a, he's a power pitcher, but he had just nine strikeouts going into this evening's affair in 19 innings. He now has six through the first two. We head to the third inning here from Monin Park. It's 1-0 Rams on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. We head to the third inning from Monin Park here in Boston, Massachusetts. Fernando Burgos back on the rubber for his third inning of work. He will face off against the top of the order, beginning with Brady Chan, who took him to the wall in the first inning with a leadoff triple, then came around to score on Cameron's sacrifice fly. Fernando, since coming over to UMass, Boston's been a stopper of sorts. Last year, he, Mantoni, and Morin made up a triple threat at the top of the rotation that helped lead the Beacons to the NCAA tournament. This year, the Beacons would like nothing more than to mimic that performance. With an assortment of freshmen thrown in here, contributing as well. Brady Chant will lead things off, as mentioned. Came into today's action hitting 327. He tripled in his first at bat. First pitch is on the outside corner with an off speed pitch, nothing in one. Good breaking ball as he continues to pitch backwards to these Suffolk hitters. Here's an 0 1. Beautiful fastball right on the outside corner, nothing in two. So Burgos, who fell behind. Chant and a couple of other batters in that first inning. Now ahead, nothing in two. Curve ball. That one's ripped to third and heads up play by Kyle Boudris going down to one knee to make the play. If he didn't, it might have taken him with him into left field. Nonetheless, it is a line out to third for the first out of the inning. Now I'll take the out any day, but that was not an executed pitch by Burgos there. That should have been on the outside corner or further, and so he could try and get a swing and miss, but it it caught the plate, and Chan almost ripped it down the line. Sean Cameron has an RBI, a sacrifice fly to center in the first. He takes a breaking ball in the outside corner, nothing in one. 
Came in hitting 324 with six driven in. He's now got seven overall as the 0 1 pitch from Fernando's chop foul. Nothing in two to the shortstop, Sean Cameron. Seth Coyley waits on deck at the top of the order. Duels with Burgos here this evening. From the windup, the 0-2 right back to Fernando. Let's it go to Charlie Hugie, who's flashed the leather all evening long, and he does so again. 6-3 the put out, two down. So Fernando, since giving up the leadoff triple, has only surrendered one hit and allowed two base runners, but he's gotten the job done and gotten five ground outs in the process. Here's the first pitch now to Coyley. On the inside corner, nothing in one. Coyley grounded out to second his first time up. He's 0 for 1. That one is just a bit low, a fastball, 1 and 1. Fernando did not like where that ball ended up going. Spun around in disgust. Coyley came in hitting 407 on the year. Team's leading hitter, though, in only seven starts. As this one misses in, it's one, excuse me, two balls. And one strike. Mentioned in the pregame show, the Beacons have played a uh, plethora of affairs here over the last week or so as this breaking ball misses away. Three and one. Beacons since the 29th have played. This will be their sixth game in a week or so. Here's a 3-1. Up and in, ball four. So that's the second walk of the game for Fernando Burgos and a two-out base runner for Matt Brenner. Meanwhile, Steve, since the 29th, only one game, and it was on the 29th. They went over Salem State for these Suffolk Rams. They had a matchup the following day canceled against Bridgewater. So they're a well-rested bunch, even though they've only won one time since March 15th. They are 1-5 over that time frame. Yeah, it's a benefit of having a turf field at home. You know, we, we can get the Beacons can get those games in, while someone with a grass field doesn't really have that benefit. It's 1-0 to Matt Brenner as Brenner comes in 0-1. He grounded out to second and the first. That one's chopped over to shortstop. Hugie will go to first with it. Overthrows him, and that's going to be a critical error as that's going to put a runner at third as runners reach the corners on what should have been out number three. It's an E6 as Charlie Hugie airmails that one to the moon. And with two down, a walk and an error, now all of a sudden has the Rams in business to extend their lead. And it'll bring up Greg Speliotis. That can be a killer for a pitcher on the mound. You think you're going to get out of it, you get a soft ground ball, and then now here you have to deal with the team's DH. He's got to be careful because Speliotis has got some pop. You know, that, that monster's big, but it's not that far. Got to make sure the ball's down and doesn't get anything underneath. Greg grounded out to short his first time up. Timeout called by Speliotis as he catches his bearings at the plate. The runner at third base is Coyley. The runner at first, Brenner. Brenner does not have great wheels as a catcher. So I don't think they'll be too worried about him stealing second, especially with Searle's arms as that breaking ball misses away. Beacons had a staff game on Monday, so they did throw a couple of relievers, but they have plenty left in the tank. As the 1-0 pitch is cued foul, jamming him in inside and out, inside outing it up the first baseline with Speliotis. Of course, keep in mind the Beacons, we've talked about all this, how much they play. They have to go right back at it at Worcester State tomorrow. And then, then at Rhode Island College this weekend. So it's really a nonstop grind the rest of the way for this Beacons club. And it's part of the playing in New England when you're going to have so many rainouts is missing away with it was Burgos. It's 2-1. and one. Burgos can't walk this guy here. He's got to go right after him. I wouldn't be surprised if he flips in a curveball for a strike. Luke Ronke is on deck. He struck out in the second inning. But right now, the focus has to be on Speliotis. Two down and two on. A 2-1 pitch. Beautiful curveball in the outside corner. Perfect placement with that one. I don't think Speliotis thought he was coming out with a 2-1 curveball. 
Yeah, if he's commanding it better than his fastball, it doesn't hurt. We'll see what he comes with now. It's two balls, two strikes, two men on base, and two outs here in the top of the third inning. Burgos gets his sign. Here he comes, a 2-2. Ground ball third first base, gobbled up by Fowler, who moses his way over to the bag to retire the side. So the Beacons once again put themselves into a little bit of trouble with two outs. A walk and an error on Charlie Hughie put runners at the corners, but Burgos gets the three unassisted ground out to retire the side. We are through two and a half innings from Monon Park. On the campus of UMass Boston, it's 1-0 Rams on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Moving from Turkey, it was a rough journey for me because when you don't really speak the language that well and when you don't really fit in the crowd, it's very easy to disappear. But I decided not to give up, so, and you must help me. <laughs> Ryan Portis will tell the rubber for his third inning as the starter, and he has been outstanding. Portis, through two innings, has allowed only one base runner. It was the Mantoni double down the third base line, but he struck out the side in the second and has five strikeouts through the first six out of this, outs of this game. So Ryan Portis will look to continue his stellar outing this inning as he will take on 8-9-1, beginning with Sal Fraschino. Following sound will be Josh Lopez in the top of the order, Nick Herzog. Sal, the leadoff hitter, center fielder by trade, hitting 260, four runs driven in. He's got terrific wheels, and with the Beacon struggling to make contact against Portis, we'll see if maybe they decide to perhaps utilize some sort of bunt play. Along with Steve Consiglio, I'm John Scudris. This is the Beacon's Broadcasting Network. It's 1-0 Suffolk Rams on an RBI sack fly for Sean Cameron. Here is Sal Fraschino stepping on in. Connecticut native. So Fraschino into the left-handed batter's box to face Ryan Portis. The right-hander winds, dines, and delivers. And an off-speed pitch cued towards first base. We'll see if Portis can get there in time. And a diving attempt from Fraschino is not in time as he has retired 4-1 the put out for the first out of the third inning. Yeah, PFPs, John, you know, pitchers got to get over and be an athlete. How much did you hate that? Pitching field, pitcher fielding practice, having to do all those routines over and over. See, I, I love fielding ground balls, but the whole run into first base really, <laughs> really wasn't for me. No, not at your frame, too. 6'6", six, six, I mean, then you have to find the bag, sometimes without even looking, and I don't know how they do it. It's muscle memory, I suppose, as that one's on the outside corner, nothing in one, to Josh Lopez, who was our player to watch today. And, Steve, Josh, you mentioned in the broadcast on Monday what a phenomenal campaign he had his freshman year, being named Rookie of the Year. Sophomore year, mired his injury, slumps. He's back at it, hitting 306 this year as the 0-1 is chopped to second base, and one second of a baseman will ground it to the other as he is retired by Kevin Higgins, 4-3. Yeah, it doesn't seem like Josh is running too well right now. You know, his speed's usually a big part of his game. He didn't really get down the line as fast as I thought he was. Uh, I'd like to see if there's something wrong with his hammies or ankles, but I'm not sure. Well, on Monday when he beat out a double play at first base, he was limping a slight bit, and we said maybe at that time it may be something. He stayed in the game, and he started today, so you assume he's okay to play, just may not be 100%. Here's Nick Herzog with two down as Ryan Portis continues to slice through the Beacons lineup like hot butter. He's got six strikeouts through the first 90 faces. Give me five strikeouts to the first 90 faces, and now from the windup, he delivers a 1-0 pitch. That one's sent to center field. 
Moving to his left is Brady Chant. Coming on in is Chant. He'll call off the left fielder to retire the side. So another one, two, three inning for the right-handed starter, Nick Brian Portis, for the Suffolk Rams. We are through three innings from Monon Park. It's 1-0 Suffolk on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. The University of Massachusetts Boston, with its scenic oceanfront campus, easily accessible to downtown Boston, is recognized as a model of excellence for urban public universities. 16 NCAA Division III sports are part of the more than 100 student organizations that create an engaging campus life in America's biggest and best college town. UMass Boston, Boston's urban public research university for the 21st century. My partner in crime, Steve Consiglio, has insights beyond belief, and he was correct in how Josh Lopez might have been feeling as he limped off after that ground out, and now he has been replaced, and Eddie Riley will come on in. What should we know about Eddie and how much of a uh, step back might this be defensively for the Beacons? Oh, it's, a, it's a big step out defensively, but it brings a little bit bigger aspect with the bat. Eddie can hit, you know, as long as he stays on top and doesn't, doesn't pop anything up, he can really hit. Really hit. It is, it is a little bit of a loss defensively, but at the same time, Eddie can still spin a double play. He can still play defense. He was the beacon starting shortstop at the beginning of the year, so you're not losing that much. But Lopez has just got that flash factor and gives you confidence as a pitcher to have right behind you. Well, with Riley stepping in at second base, it will be the right fielder, Luke Ronke, beginning things here in the top half of the fourth inning. Ronke's 0 for 1. He struck out swinging. In fact, the only strikeout the Fernandos had through three. Curveball and another backdoor curve strikes the outside corner. Nothing in one. Burgos here is at 56 pitches. You know, that's not too much, but it's it's a good amount through three innings. I'd hope to see uh, Burgos get through six, maybe even get into the seventh inning. But uh, with 56, 57 pitches after that, it's going to be tough. He's going really going to have to grind. Beacons would love to save the pen with a game on the horizon at Worcester State tomorrow. And there's another strikeout of Ronke. He's been struck out twice, both swinging by Fernando Burgos. And that's one down here in the fourth inning. That's a good sign because Burgos just threw three straight strikes, you know. He didn't get behind. He didn't. He just attacked, 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 and, and Ronke was able to get himself out. Brings up Kevin Belsky, and there's a breaking ball low, not, or excuse me, 1-0. and oh. Belsky singled and was stranded at second back in the second inning. Came in hitting 318 with a homer and six driven in. 1-0 pitch from Fernando. That one's inside out and out of play up the third base line. It's 1-1. One one. This is the bottom of the order. Belsky, then Tyrone, then the nine-hole hitter Higgins. So you'd like to see Fernando get through this fourth inning smoothly. <laughs> Here's a 1-1. Right down Broadway, one ball and two strikes as he comes back with the heater. Fernando works quickly, and he continues to. The 1-2 pitch inside as that one misses. Two balls and two strikes. Try to come back with that fastball, and the two-seamer inside, which can cut right back on the inside corner, but miss there. From the windup, Burgos is 2-2 pitch. That one's ripped to left field. It's going to be trouble tailing away from the Beacons left fielder McCormick, and it drops down. Ryan's got a good arm, and he slings it in on one hop to hold. Pelsky to first base. So a good play by McCormick, even if he couldn't catch up to that slicer down the line, as he does hold Pelsky to a one-out single. So that will bring up the third baseman, Curtis Tyrone. Tyrone is hitting 167 on the year. He walked his first time up and was stranded that back in the second. From the stretch, Fernando's first pitch is just a bit outside, 1-0. After Curtis, it'll be Kevin Higgins. Fernando wants a new baseball.
Burgos has continuously pitched backwards to these Rams hitters, starting them out with that curveball and utilizing the hard stuff later in the at-bats. When he's locating that fastball, it works, but the problem is he struggled to locate it through the first three plus as there's a curveball up and away. Two balls and no strikes. Fernando has two walks today and three hits allowed. Here's a 2 0. Swung on and missed as taking a mighty hack of that one was Ty Road. As he was trying to break a window in the dorms in right field. Burgos gets his sign from Searles. And takes a look over at first base. Diving back in time is Belsky. Burgos got some quick feet as a pitcher. You got, really got to be aware at first base. You mentioned his pickoff move earlier. See if he takes another peek over. 2-1. Coming home with it. And another big swing and miss. Searles with a quick snap to first. Not in time. Belsky. A first baseman, not typically a position of speed, but the Beacons are keeping him close. You always have to be careful with Anthony Searles behind the dish. He had a pickoff. In fact, that was, I believe, the argument uh, that we were alluding to where the umpires overruled the call on Monday as that one was low. And it's three balls and two strikes to Tyrone. This is a Suffolk team that started the season 3-0 and 4-1. and They then lost five consecutive affairs, including the 6-5 loss to UMass on the 25th. Snapped that skid with a 7-5 win over Salem State last week as this one's ripped off the screen. That was a hanging curveball there, John. He really got away with it. Got to make sure he keeps that ball down, otherwise it's going to end up in the gaps. So with a 3-2 count and one out, we'll see if they decide to test it with Belsky. I wouldn't think with Searle's arm. You never do know, though, as here's a 3-2 pitch. Runner doesn't go, and it's ripped off the screen again. Yeah, you can't risk the strike, strike, well, excuse me, strike him out, throw him out, double play, because you got your nine hitter on deck. You know, you really want to flip the line up to the top to start off the next inning even if, uh, if Higgins can't get a hit. Fernando sees a 3-2 pitch on coming. The payoff pitch. Just low, ball four, and that is going to put runners at first and second with one out here in the fourth inning. It's the third walk of the game for the Beacons right-hander, Fernando Burgos. That yeah, gets his walk total up to, to, to 15, you know. That's, that's way too much for a kid like him who probably walked less than 40 on the year last year. So that puts runners at first and second with one down for Higgins. Kevin is 0 for 1. He popped out to shortstop his first time up. Beacons a double play depth up the middle. Here's the first pitch, and that one on the outside corner. Nothing in one. Kevin, a native of North Attleboro, Massachusetts, and Bishop Fian High, as he stands 5'10 and 175, crowding that right-handed batter's box. Burgos is 0-1 and taking a mighty hack and missing, but it gets away from Searles, and that'll allow the runners to advance into scoring position. So a pass ball, and the guilty party is Anthony Searles, as that puts two men in scoring position with just one out, and we'll see what the Beacons decide to do defensively. I just got an update from our stat guy. Burgos walked 19 and 60 innings last year, and he's already up to 15 this year. We have a stack guy? Seth Renski. Uh, of course, the jack of all trades. This one's chopped to short. Charlie Hughey comes in, but the job well done from Kevin Higgins as he gets an RBI, his sixth of the season. It's a 6-3 put out, and it does bring home Kevin Belsky. So one Kevin drives in another, and with two down here in the fourth inning, it's 2-0 Rams here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. And that pass ball, absolutely critical. Uh, yeah. Ball hit like that, you might, probably aren't going to get a double play. But now it's already 2-0. You have a chance for a third run. 
And that one's ripped up the middle and bringing home the third run is Brady Chant. His second hit of the game and Burgos is struggling due to those command issues. That walk and that single leads to the ground out and an RBI as well as the single. It's the 10th RBI on the year for Brady Chant bringing home Tyrone and it is 3-0 Suffolk University. Chant is uh, really seeing the ball well right now because he's... He's crushed three baseballs off of Burgos, and you don't see that very often. He had that triple, he had a hard line out, and then that one, as this one gets away on the chance to pick off, and that's going to allow Chant to move all the way over to second with two down. So the Beacons shooting themselves in the foot continuously here in this fourth inning. That is an error, the second error of the game on the Beacons, and it puts another run in scoring position. So you have the pass ball, you have the error there. And we'll have a meeting on the mound as Fernando Burgos has struggled with the command and now is struggling commanding his pickoff move as well. Beacons down 3-0 to nothing to the Suffolk Rams. They were trying to complete a double header back from March the 25th. A walk-off 6-5 win in that one. However, inclement weather forced the postponement towards this evening. The Beacons, who have won six of seven against a team that has lost five of six, now trailing 3 0. Meeting is over and adjourned as Sean Cameron steps in. He's 0 for 2. He does have a run driven in, seven now on the year, and he has a chance with a single to make it eight. Right-handed hitter against the right-handed pitcher, Burgos. From the stretch. And Fernando with a two-seamer inside and a bit up, 1-0. Oh. Three runs on four hits with no errors for the Rams. No runs, one hit, and two errors. It's never good when you have more errors than hits, which is the case for the Beacons right now through three. Stepping off the rubber is Burgos. And right now with the way Ryan Portis is pitching, Beacons need all the help they can get. It's 2-0 now. As Fernando will try to tiptoe his way out of any further damage. Give up a run in the first. Now two here in the fourth inning. The 2-0 pitch. Skied out of play as this one's going to reach the seats. And I hope that didn't hit anybody's car out there. Heard a loud bang from the press box, which is impressive considering we're enclosed. Yeah, it's nice and warm up here. It is. I can only imagine how the fans here, which is a pretty decent attendance for a night like tonight. I mean, I'd be surprised if many people came out, and here they are. But it is a local matchup, two teams from Boston. As that one misses up, it's 3-1. and one, And command of the curveball has become a bit of an issue in this inning. He was so good with the hook through the first three. Right now he's behind three balls and one strike. Cameron waiting. The 3-1 pitch. Jam shot right up in the air. Searles takes the mask off. He has his sights lined up and makes the play. And Burgos gives him a bit of a thank you for getting himself out of the inning. It's a foul out behind the dish. However, the damage is done as the Rams do get two runs on two hits and do leave a man on base. We head to the bottom of the fourth inning here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. It is 3-0 Suffolk U. I'm a Division III student athlete, and I know how powerful words can be. The term gay doesn't mean stupid, lame, or less than. So I pledge to speak up if I hear the term gay used in a derogatory way or any other homophobic terms. If you can play, you can play in Division Three. I'm a Division Three student athlete and my teammates unconditionally accepted me as part of their family. 
so now I pledge to do the same for others. If you can play, you can play in Division Three. Beacon's offense is going to have to start coming to the plate with vigor as they trail 3 nothing after three and a half innings. Along with Steve Consiglio, I'm John Scudris. Beacons have been struggling at the dish against this six foot two inch senior right hander, Ryan Portis. To be junior right hander, Ryan Portis. Portis, through the first three innings, has recorded five strikeouts. He's allowed just the one hit, the double from Mantoni. And now he'll have to toil with Dan again this inning as it'll be two, three, and four, beginning with Charlie Hughie. Charlie getting set to head into the right-handed batter's box against Portis. Charlie, a native of Sandy Hook, Connecticut. Of course, Sandy Hook became famous for unfortunate reasons back in 2000. I believe it was 12. Charlie will try to get this rally started as this one's in the dirt for a ball. 1-0. For all you Sox fans at home, the score is still 0-0. Sales having a pretty good game, but uh, I'd just like to let everybody else know I'm a big Mets fan, and they just went up 1-0 on our Jay Bruce home run. The Beacons could beat the Atlanta Braves this year, though, Steve, so I wouldn't give it too much credibility. That says you. I think they're going to be the pretty good in the NL East. Probably, the, the probably coming, coming third. No. They got a lot of veteran talent. No. Including Bartolo Colon. Yeah, veteran talent, if that's what you want to call it. 20 years ago, they were talented. It's, we have some talent in the batter's box right now. Charlie Hughie came in hitting 229. Here's the 1 1 to Charlie. And that one's a beautiful breaking ball. Is that one just 12 to 6 drop as it's 1 and 2? I think Seth Orensky will appreciate me giving a shout out to our Philadelphia Phillies, who are 1 0 on the campaign for the first time in a couple of years. And they'll be in the last in the NL East. I cannot wait till that is not the case. As this one's granted a third base, gobbled up out there. And a Quick, strong throw across the diamond by Tyrone as Curtis guns down Charlie Hughie to begin the bottom half of the fourth inning. Last place. I mean, they're bad. we'll see. They're not that bad. They have a pretty good uh, offseason. They brought in Michael Saunders, Howie Kendrick, some veterans. The yeah, pitching Clay, snaps you off. Clay Buckholtz. Yeah, he's real good. He's the fifth starter. I'm not going to say that they're going to contend with the New York Mets or the Nationals, but I think they should... I expect them to finish ahead of your, uh, your surprise team here, the Atlanta Braves, as the first pitch to Dan Mantoni is away with a fastball 1-0. Then again, it's, it's baseball. It's such a long season, you never know. Just got to watch out for injuries. That's yeah. the worst part about it. Just like Murph's out for us, it changes the team, but you like to see them bounce back, as the Beacons have done. Here's a 1-0 on the outside corner, 1-1. One one. That ball is way outside. That was not a strike. Sounds like a Mets fan now. Is <laughs> a 1-1 one, one is ensuing from Ryan Portis. Curveball. Dan chops this one to shortstop. Gobbled up out there by Cameron. Fired across the diamond, 6-3. And the Beacons, like you said earlier, not having great at-bats. Very quick at-bats against Ryan Portis and allowing him to cruise through right now three and two-thirds. Portis is only at 38 pitches oh, now. Goodness. He's that's deep into the fourth inning. That's that's impressive. You know, usually 10 pitches an inning is perfect. And keep in mind, he also has five strikeouts. So usually, when you have that amount of K's, it's going to inflate your pitch count. He's just going right after people. We'll see if he goes after Boudreaux. That one dips low. One ball and no strikes. Kyle's 0 for 1. He fouled out behind the plate his first time up. 
Beacons do score most of their runs against the bullpen. So I like I really hope they start working at bats and just move the pitch or inflate the pitch count and get them out of the game. Suffolk will be back at home tomorrow for a scheduled four o'clock matchup against Endicott College. So they'd like nothing more than to see Portis continue to perform, though with the weather that's coming, we'll see if that game actually does occur. Here's a 2-0 pitch to Kyle, up and away, ball three, and so finally seeing the Beacons take some pitches, you'd like to see the red light here for the Beacons third baseman. Absolutely, there's no way Boudreaux swings at this. He's just too smart of a hitter. Left-handed swinger as he gets set for a 3-0 pitch from Portis, and a curve ball right there. Poor Kyle wasn't so sure. Never want to step out before Empire makes the call, and now it looks like Brendan Igerbrode had a few words to say for the home plate umpire as he takes off his mask and barks back, and now here we go. Cooler heads prevail for the moment. Of course, this is a matchup with uh, a rich history, both in matchups in the past, but also Coach Igerbrode, of course, an alumnus of Suffolk, and no love lost there, I don't think. There's a 3-1. Rip, deep right field from Kyle Boudreaux on the run and in play and going to make the play is Luke Ronke to retire the side. So Boudreaux jumps on a 3-1 fastball and lifts it to medium deep right field, but the Beacons continue to be stymied by Ryan Portis. We are through four innings now here from Monin Park. It's 3-0 Suffolk on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. What separates UMass Boston from other schools is the fact that a large percentage of students commute. For me, it takes two hours each day to go to and from school, but every second has been worth it because the students that come here are serious about learning, they value their education, and understand where it'll take them in the future. This is what UMass Boston means to me. Well, as Ryan Portis has retired 10 straight and 12 of 13 to begin the game, Fernando Burgos gets back on the pitching mound as he will look to bounce back from an inning that saw him give up two runs, just one of them earned. And the Beacons trailing 3-0 through four innings here from Monon Park. He'll face off against 3-4-5, and five, beginning with Seth Coyley, who is 0-for-1, ground out in a walk. Coyley went 3-for-3 three three in game one of the so-called doubleheader. Don't ask me why I just did air quotes on the radio, but I did. <laughs> hey, it looked good from, from here. <laughs> After Coily, it'll be Matt Brenner and Greg Speliotis. Beacons will be back at it tomorrow for a scheduled matchup at Worcester State. We'll see if that takes place. Earlier today, the Beacons softball team split a doubleheader against the Plymouth State Panthers. Got Gigi Braga to my left here. Fresh off the Split doubleheader. So here's Seth Coyley stepping in. He's 0 for 1. He walked his last time up and was stranded at third base back in the third inning. Beacons have had just one base runner in this game. It came back in the first inning, as this one is right down Broadway, nothing in one. By comparison, the base runners have been abundant for the Rams, including errors. They have nine base runners so far through four innings, as that one is right down the heart of the plate, nothing in two. And yet somehow Beacon's down just three, nothing right now. Burgos has tiptoed out of trouble. The 0-2, ground ball foul up the first baseline. Eddie Riley is in at second pace for Josh Lopez. In case you're just joining us, he came in halfway through this first four innings. As that one is right down the plate for strike three. So strikeout looking for the right-hander Burgos. That is his first strikeout looking of the day in third overall. It'll bring up Matt Brenner. Brenner... Rips this one to right field. He's 0 for 2 coming in. He'll be 0 for 3 as Fowler will squeeze in deep first base territory. Pop out to first, and that's the second out for Speliotis. 
This is more of what you're liking from Fernando Burgos, going right after the hitters. Gets the strikeout looking of Coily and a first pitch pop out by Brenner. And Speliotis steps in. Designated hitter came in hitting 250. He's 0 for 2 today as that one is right there, nothing in one. From the wind up, 0 1 is way outside. One ball and one strike. Hyde Park native ready, the 1-1. One, one. Breaking ball just missed. 2-1 and one now to Speliotis with Luke Ronke on deck. Two one ground ball right back to Burgos. Tipped the glove, but it ended up aiding it right over to Eddie Riley, who guns down the designated hitter for the visiting Rams. So a one, two, three inning, the first of the day for Fernando Burgos. As that one goes, I'm going to call it one, four, three to end the top half of the fifth inning. We head to the bottom half of the fifth here from Monon Park. It's still three nothing Rams on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. UMass Boston was my first choice because when I came to the campus, I saw that there was a lot of diversity. There's a lot of people um, here. There is a lot of international students, so it's really cool to meet people from different countries, different parts of the world. I'm Julia Murphy. I'm from Canton, Massachusetts. I'm Olivia Murphy. I'm from Canton, Massachusetts. Well, we're sisters. We're sisters. <laughs> I play volleyball and she plays basketball. Here they have a freshman success community. So each major has their own community that you can join as a freshman and you take classes with them, you do study groups with them. So it was really helpful getting to know people in your major right away. So in health exercise sciences, we have an internship at the end where it's so much better to have like an advisor helping you out, like telling you which classes to choose. Along with my partner in crime, Steve, right now we're looking at a, uh, a big, big inning here for the Beacons because they have the heart of the order begin with Chris Fowler. Last time they had that, they went one, two, three, strikeout looking, strikeout swinging, strikeout swinging back in the second inning. So it's going to be critical for the Beacons to get things going here, already down 3 nothing. Yeah, like I said earlier. Yeah, like I said earlier, they they really got to start working working at bats. You know, hopefully they can get the couple three ball counts. You know, some long at bats, maybe seven to ten pitch at bats. Really inflate uh, Portis's pitch pitch count. Get them out of the game and just start attacking their uh, bullpen. Steve Consiglio here with John Scudris as the Beacons Broadcasting Network brings you this rescheduled affair between Suffolk University and UMass Boston. It will be Chris Fowler to start out. Chris on the evening, 0 for 1. He struck out swinging his first time up. From the windup, Portis' first pitch, and Fowler chops it foul. Nothing in one. Portis has allowed just one base runner. It was the double back in the first inning by Mantoni. Other than that, he's been perfect including five strikeouts. A very low pitch count. Here's the 0-1. Curve ball on that one. Dips outside, one ball and one strike. Fowler red hot coming into play today. He's been Beacon's best hitter this year as he takes another off-speed pitch on the outside corner. And Portis with that backdoor hook is just dazzling the Beacons as doesn't seem to be a whole lot that they can do. Ryan from the windup, the one two, another curveball. Fowler rips it to second. Gobbled up out there by Higgins, and Kevin fires to first base to retire. The Beacons first baseman. 4-3 on the putout. One down here in the fifth inning. That'll bring up Ryan McCormick. Beacon's left fielder came in hitting 316. However, he's 0 for 1 with a strikeout looking. Came back in that second inning. Portis' first pitch to Ryan and starts another at bat with a strike. Nothing in one. Portis is really cruising right now, John. 
McCormick, a freshman from Cumberland, Rhode Island. Here's the 0-1. That one breaks away. One ball and one strike. No runs, one hit, and two errors for UMass Boston through the first four and a third. Here's the wind-up from Ryan Portis. Another breaking ball, and he is just dazzling with that breaking ball as he continues to just absolutely harass the Beacons with off-speed pitches. From the wind-up, the one-two pitch. Inside, he got him. Plunks the batter on the back as Ryan McCormick will feel that one tomorrow, but he is the second base runner of the evening for UMass Boston. Really sold that one, John. Well, Gigi Braga over here taking a picture with the flash on, which might have affected the pitcher. I don't know. I'm not going to complain. And luckily, the umpires aren't listening. I just told her to keep doing it. Although we might not want that because the Beacons might be too battered and bruised by that point. I kid, it probably wasn't any effect. Nonetheless, there's a one-out base runner for McCormick who took that one square in the back. Reminds me of when I was eight years old, took a fastball square in the back. Never felt comfortable in the batter's box again, and that's why I'm up here, not down there. Is that one is right down Broadway for strike one. That and talent, you know, that, that was an issue as well. Yeah, I wasn't in the batter's box for that reason. I just couldn't hit a curveball. <laughs> like uh, Pedro Serrano in Major League. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't have that kind of power either. That's why you were a pitcher, as the Vegans will try to get something going against this starting pitcher, Portis, in a late timeout called by... Anthony Searles, I'm sure Portis didn't appreciate that as he allows this one to trickle over to a shortstop. That's a veteran move there by Searles, just calling time, time trying to get rid of uh, Portis's rhythm in that situation. Searles is 0 for 1. He struck out to end the second. Oh, one pitch ripped left field and deep. On his horse out there is the left fielder, and he chases it down. Does the left fielder, Seth Coyley, for the second out of the inning. So Anthony gave it a bit of a ride, but on a cold night, all for naught, two down. Similar to that fly out to end the last inning by Boudris. Looked really good off the bat, and unfortunately, just nothing going. Yeah, just not carrying here tonight. Cold, no wind. It's pretty rare for the for Beacon Stadium not to be, you know, windy as heck and just sending balls out of here left and right. Can tend to be a launching pad. Now we have a timeout. We may see if Ryan McCormick's day is done. It looks like he's feeling the pain a bit too much. He can't even looks like he can't even lift up that right arm. Maybe a shoulder injury for Ryan McCormick. Nonetheless, he will be removed from this affair and replaced on the base pass. Looks like by Danny Brown, the freshman from Hudson, New Hampshire. See if Danny eventually does stay in once the Beacons get to the field. Most likely would. So the freshman replaces another as Brown is in for McCormick. And Sal Fraschino steps in with two down. Sal's 0 for 1, grounded out to second, 4 1 on the put out to begin the third. And Sal will almost mimic that again as he grounds out to first. Portis slips over, 1-3 on the putout, and meagerly the Beacons go down without much of a fight. There was a hit by pitch that left a man on base, but the Beacons yet again unable to muster anything against Ryan Portis, his right arm. We head to the top half of the sixth inning. It's 3-0 Suffolk on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. The five-campus UMass system is the university that educates the workforce of Massachusetts. We recognize that we are truly here for a reason, and that recognition inspires us and drives us every single day.
So Danny Brown will stay in the game for Ryan McCormick. However, he will shift over from left to right with Nick Herzog moving from right to left. So the outfield is now Herzog in left, Fraschino in center, and Danny Brown in right. So Ryan McCormick uh, went 0 for 1. He struck out and was hit by a pitch. His day is done, and Fernando Burgos will stay out there for the sixth inning. So what you had wished earlier on in about the third inning is apparently going to come to fruition. He'll work here into the sixth inning. Yeah, I mean, hopefully he can finish it and maybe even move on. Uh, he's only trying to find his pitch count right now. 88, so this might be his last inning. I don't think he'll go much over 100 in, today, in tonight's game. Well, he'll get... Six, seven, and eight to begin. Beginning with Luke Ronke, who is 0 for 2 with a couple of strikeouts. First pitch is swung on and missed. Nothing in one. After Ronke, it'll be Kevin Belsky, Curtis Tyrone. If anyone reaches, Kevin Higgins will turn the lineup over. That one is low. One ball and one strike to Ronke. A native of Randolph, New Jersey. That's on the inside corner with a fastball. One ball and two strikes. From the stretch, that one is just a bit low. Two balls and two strikes from Burgos to Ronke. Fernando gets his sign, the 2-2 pitch in the dirt, and not with the doctor order to begin this inning as he's now over 90 pitches and he's a 3-2 count. There is action in the bullpen for UMass Boston. Here's the 3-2 pitch, curveball missed up. Actually, that looked like a curveball first, but then it never curved as this one misses high. And it's a leadoff walk to Ronke, who is now... Got a walk to go along with those two strikeouts. It brings up Belsky. Belsky is two for two. He singled and scored in the fourth. He also singled and was stranded back in the second. So he's hit Burgos well. A native of Norristown, Pennsylvania, near my hometown. As this one is ripped foul and out of play. Watch your heads in the Suffolk dugout. Now, there is a little bit of movement in the Beacons bullpen. I just can't figure out who it is yet, and I'll let you know once I find out. Beacons obviously trying to get Burgos as far as they can. The 0-1 instead sees a pickoff to first, not in time. On Monday, the Beacons used four relievers, beginning with Steve Witkowski. Joe McGuire came in and got the win. Bobby Tramandozzi pitched the final few as this one is outside for a ball, one and one. Beacons down three to nothing here from Monon Park in Boston, Massachusetts as Suffolk has got a run in the first, two in the fourth and ridden the right arm of the starter, Ryan Portis, as this one is just a bit late on a pickoff move. Working from the stretch is Burgos. The 1-1 one, one ensuing. Fernando taking a three looks over and calling timeout is the batter, Belsky. Beacon's very bothered by Ronke right now. From the stretch. The 1-1 pitch, curveball ripped out of play up the third baseline. Ronke on the campaign has just two stolen bases in three attempts. Team leader in steals is Sean Cameron with five. It's actually tied with Brady Chant at the top of that order. Both have five stolen bases. From the stretch, here's Fernando taking another look at first. Diving back in time is Ronke. And Anthony Searles will go on out to talk to him. Might just be creating time for that bullpen to get, whoever's in the bullpen get warmed up. 
I think it's Brian Kaufman, but I'm not 100% sure. Kaufman, the right-handed junior from Farmingdale, New York. Here is the one-two pitch. Ripped down the line, and that is a foul ball. So almost a critical extra base hit there, but about five or six feet to the right of the foul line in first base side. And it stays one ball and two strikes. That one was hit hard. That could have ended up being a triple if it really got all the way in the corner. Beacons down 3 nothing. The damage done in the first on a triple by Chant and the RBI sacrifice fly from Cameron. As it's a pitch out and nothing doing. It's 2-2. Two and two. two runs were also scored in the fourth on a single and a walk followed by a pass ball and an error. And then a single from Brady Champ brought in the second run. That was Burgos' 100th pitch. The 2-2 back up the middle. Great double play opportunity. Charlie Hughie takes it to the bag and then fires the first for the double play. Six unassisted three for the twin killing. And Charlie Hughie shows why he has continued to impress from shortstop as he gets the double play two down. I think Burgos just bought himself another batter as well, John. That was a critical piece of pitching there to induce the double play right up the middle. Good body control from Hugie. And with two down, that'll bring up Tyrone, who is yet to register an official bat. He's walked twice and scored a run. That one is low, 1-0. and oh. Tell you what, for a guy hitting 167, Fernando has had trouble attacking Curtis Tyrone with two walks and now behind 1-0. and oh. Out of the windup, the 1 0 pitch. That one is lifted into left center field. On his horse is Fraschino, and he'll make the. No, he dropped it! And the third error of the game for UMass Boston is Sal Fraschino called off Herzog and drops the ball on a weak fly ball to left center field, and it's starting to look like the Bad News Bears all over again. That is an E8, and the inning continues, and we'll see if that's it for Fernando Burgos. It looks like they're going to keep him out there. So Tyrone's reached base all three times, two walks and now an error, which I think that was the most egregious of all of them. Kevin Higgins steps up. He is 0 for 2. Pickoff move to first, not in time. And now how critical is that double play ball? Not that critical because there only, only would have been a one out and the runners wouldn't have been advancing. Not the give you a hard time well I mean at the same time there'd be no outs and the base is loaded now as this one is in the dirt one and oh fair enough fair enough it's a shame they don't have a Steve Consiglio to throw in there at this point isn't it yeah a little sidearm righty get right out of it here's a 1-0 from Burgos that one chopped up the line it's going to go foul in front of Kyle Boudreaux Of course, that double play ball argument always reigns back to the butterfly effect. If they didn't get the double play, would the previous batter still be up? And would Sal have dropped the ball? Probably would have been more on his toes with runners on base and less than two outs. That's a good point. Maybe looking to make a throw to third if he does catch it. Does catch it. Or get the runner at third from not advancing. Right now, Fernando's job is to get... Kevin Higgins, here's the 1-1. One, one. There goes the runner line drive, base hit to right field. We'll see if it's cut off well by Brown. He gets there, and he's going to hold the runner at third base, but it is a two-out single. And now the error on Fresino looms large because the top of the order and the one man who's absolutely hammered the Beacons this evening, Brady Chance, steps up, and I think that's it for Fernando Burgos. Uh, coach hasn't come out yet, but I think he should be pulled in this situation. We'll see how long they wait if they do. This is gutsy to leave in a guy who's been hit hard all three times by Brady Chant. He had a triple and a run scored in the first. 
to deep left center. A line drive to third that Kyle Boudreaux caught on the line, which was scorched, and then a hard hit single to right. Is that 106 pitches, John? And that'll and here, do it. Yep, here comes Brennan Igerbro. So Igerbro will come on out, and they will get the right-hander, Kaufman, to come on in for Burgo. So Fernando almost got his way through six innings. He should have. Got the double play off the bat of Kevin Belsky to put two out and nobody on. However, the error by Fresino in left center field, followed by the single from Kevin Higgins that puts runners at the corners, has chased the Beacon starting pitcher. We will have all the numbers on Brian Coffin in the conclusion of this top of the sixth inning when we come back. It's 3-0 Rams on the Beacon's broadcasting network. UMass Boston is my first choice because of the incredible theater department. Because it has an excellent honors college. Because here I get to interact with professors one-on-one. -on -one. Because I'm not going to be crazy in debt when I graduate. Because at UMass Boston I've met professors who have changed my life. My first choice. My first choice. My first choice. My first choice. Make the University of Massachusetts Boston your first choice. Visit umb.edu slash first choice. So Brian Kaufman is the new chucker for Brendan Igerbrodt's Beacons. Kaufman on the campaign is 0-0. Zero and zero. This will be his fifth appearance. He's got a 1.23 ERA in 14 and two-thirds innings. He's allowed 14 hits, two earned runs, struck out six, and walked just one. So Kaufman, who was electric last year and has had a solid start to this year, leading the team in ERA, among pitchers with more than one inning pitched. Is in now to face the top of the order, beginning with Brady Chant, who is scorching hot. Two for three today. Meanwhile, your New York Mets are falling apart from the seams, it looks like there, Steve. Yeah, I don't want to hear right now, John. I'm a little upset in this situation. Looking like the Beacons right now with the bases loaded in New York at City Field. Meanwhile, here from Monin Park, UMass Boston sees runners at the corners. The runner at third base is Tyrone. The runner at first is Higgins. And the batter will be Brady Champ. What should we expect from Kaufman here? He's got a good changeup and an even better slider. His fastball runs a little bit like Burgos's, but it, I think he throws a little bit harder. Hopefully he can control that fastball better than Burgos did in, the, in the, uh, tonight's game. He'll have to against a guy who has been outstanding this season. Came in hitting 327. Tied for the team lead with nine runs batted in coming in. Runners at the corners. Kaufman ready from the stretch. First pitch is low, 1-0. Tyrone is at third. Higgins at first. Both of those runners are the responsibility of the starter, Burgos. Although with the error, none of these runs would be earned. Here's the 1-0. That one in the dirt, 2-0. So the Beacons, who have allowed three runs already, with only two of them earned, in danger of falling behind further here in a sixth inning that has continued to drag on despite a couple of quick outs. Kaufman gets his sign. The 2-0 pitch, and that one is low, ball three. Three balls and no strikes to chant with Cameron on deck. And they're just going to put him on. Interesting decision without the base open to load the bases for Cameron as Kaufman throws ball four intentionally. And that will load the bases for Sean Cameron, who's hitting 324 on the year despite an 0 for 3 day. Well, Chance red hot. You 
you don't want to throw three straight fastballs down the middle because one could end up in the gaps or even over that big monster. And they're just playing it safe. You know, two outs, just get your out here, play a big infield, and go to any base. Biggest at bat of the game so far. Beacons down 3 nothing. top half of the sixth inning. Two outs and Brian Kaufman on the rubber. Bases are loaded full of Rams who will try to bore their way to a bigger lead this evening as this one is grounded foul up the third baseline. The runner at third is Tyrone. The runner at second, Higgins. And now Brady Chant at first. And the... Batter is Sean Cameron, a native of Milford, Connecticut, and a senior at 5'8", 150. Still working from the stretch despite the bases loaded is Kaufman. Here's the 0-1. That one's grounded again, foul. And so Brian now with a couple of foul balls up the third base line is ahead of the count, nothing in two. Came with a couple of fastballs on the inner half. We'll see if he tries to just attack the outside corner with this pitch. He waves off Searles' first sign. Searles sets up on the outside corner. Here's an 0-2. Swung on and missed. He struck him out with a changeup. Beautiful piece of pitching to get out of the jam for Brian Kaufman as Brendan Agabrote, with all the right moves, gets out of the sixth inning. Despite the bases being loaded, the Beacons get out of it. Paris no runs. Changed my life. And on one hit and one error, Those we head to the bottom of the sixth inning. In Paris. It's still 3-0 Rams. A man in a tuxedo walked in. On the Beacons and broadcasting network. Gown. And it was stunning. It all hit me. It was, it was like a lightning bolt. There was this world of beauty and style that I wanted to be a part of. That was the beginning of the journey. And that all came through the University of Massachusetts. And that was really a key moment for me. That's one of those moments you never forget. A reminder to check out all of your UMass Boston Beacons Athletics actions on all of our social media venues, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Just check out at UMass Beacons, as well as beaconsathletics.com. Along with Steve Consiglio, I'm John Scooter. It's bottom of the sixth inning for Monon Park. It's still 3-0 Rams, as the starting pitcher, Ryan Portis, has delivered through the first five. Beacons managing just one hit and two base runners. However, they do start 9-1-2, beginning with Eddie Riley. Here in the sixth. Now, Eddie hasn't seen Portis yet tonight. Let's see if he jumps on a fastball early in the count. Riley on the year, 194. A 6 of 31 with four driven in. And an on-base percentage, though, of 324. So he does have six walks. In a situation such as this, a walk is as good as a hit. Beacons need to get base runners, something they have not done more than twice today as there's a curveball to begin the at-bat, but that one left high. He's got a hard hook. Reminds me of Barry Zito back in the day. He had the softest hook there was. Wasn't he the one with the hard hook? No. Well, you're too young. What do you know? Zito? That one, that that one is right loop. there, but a little bit high, 2-0. Oh. Zito on the A's had that big looping. He had the looping hook, but he also had the hard hook. A tight slider. You know what? We're going to watch a video next time. We'll, we'll show you. <laughs> I'll pull it up right now. Pull it up. You have the computer there. Barry Zito curveball. Here's a 2-0. Oh. Inside corner, and Eddie didn't like it. It's 2-1. and one. Oh, yeah. Get him when he's on the Giants. That's, that's really good. <laughs> that looks pretty hard to me there, buddy. 78 miles an hour. That's pretty hard to me there, buddy. For that, that one's outside, 3-1. and one. For a guy that throws 92. Now 
So now Riley is ahead of the count, three balls and one strike. With Nick Herzog on deck. Ooh. Ooh it's way outside. That's brutal. That one just off the plate, but called a strike three and two. Now a big pitch coming up to Riley, who's walked six times this year. He's had as many walks as he does hits. Here's a 3-2. Ripped to center field, and right in his tracks there is the center fielder, Brady Chant. And that's the first out of the inning on a fly out to center. Nick Herzog will step up. He's 0 for 2. Herzog struck out looking and flew out to center field. The left fielder, number 34, Nick Herzog. First pitch to Nick. He squares around a bunt and just bounces it right off the plate. Nothing in one. It's been the tale of the Beacons evening. They got a double in the first inning and a hit by pitch in the fifth. Other than that, nobody has reached base. From the windup, the 0-1 pitch. Curve ball, whew, just missed nipping Herzog on the front elbow. It's one ball and one strike. Thought Zog was going to let that one hit him, take the free base. Wouldn't be a bad move here. Beacons have one hit by pitch. That was McCormick back in the fifth. He's since left the game. Here's the 1-1. Swung on and missed, strike two. Beacons trying to get a rally going in the bottom of the sixth inning, down 3-0. Here's the 1-2 to Herzog. Curveball ripped to left field. That is a mile high as coming over as Coyley to make the play. And there's two down here in the sixth inning. Bring up Charlie Hugie, who you're going to hear this a lot, is 0 for 2. Struck out looking and grounded out to third. Beacons just haven't hit the ball hard all day today, John. It's just... Uh, combination of not good at bats and and just not as not good swings late in the count. Looking like the Mets tonight are the Beacons as Mets are tied 1-1, John. I don't want to hear it. If I go dark for a while, it's because Steve strangled me. As this one is grounded towards third base, coming on in to make the play and fire across the diamond in time is the third baseman Tyrone as Curtis retires Charlie Hugie to retire the side. So the Beacons go quietly into the ninth here in the sixth inning. As we head towards the seventh, it's almost stretch time for Monon Park. It's still 3 0. Suffolk on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Celebrate the soggy shoes and the slow starts. Celebrate the lessons learned along the way. These are the wins. Not the shiny, nail-biting kind. These are the last a lifetime kind. Brian Kaufman will remain out this for his first full inning of relief work. He will toil with a dangerous part of the order, 3-4-5, as the Beacons trail 3-0 in the top half of the seventh inning. Along with Steve Consiglio, the former Beacons hurler, I am John Scudris. This is the Beacons Broadcasting Network. UMass Boston had won 6 of 7 coming in. This was the rescheduled portion of Game 2 of the doubleheader from March 25th against Suffolk. Game one, the Beacons won 6-5 on an Anthony Searles walk-off double, but things not quite going their way this evening as they've fallen behind 3-0, and the bats just have not been there. They've gotten one hit, came back in the first inning from Mantoni. Only one other batter's even reached base. It was a hit by pitch, which knocked McCormick out of the game. So things have not been going well for the Beacons, but Kaufman was able to get out of a jam with a strikeout of Cameron in the sixth. And now we'll begin things with Sean Coyley here in the seventh. Coyley is 0 for 2. He walked, struck out, and grounded out. Brian from the windup. 
The first pitch is lifted to right field. It's going to be tough. This one trailing towards the line. It's foul and a break for the Beacons as Brown was playing way off the line, and that would have been trouble. It's like no man's land out there in right field sometimes. Yeah, it's the Bermuda Triangle between the first base, second base, and right fielder sometimes, even on the other side of the field too, but usually seems like the shortstop gets the more balls than the second baseman for some reason. Nothing in one now to Seth Coyley. This one's ripped through the hole on the left side. Great diving snag from Hughey. A cannon for an arm and a great snag on the hop from Fowler, but he couldn't keep his foot on the bag. Good effort all around, but Chris could not keep his foot on the bag in order to get the out, and that is an infield single for Seth Coyley, his first hit of the day. So a great effort from Charlie Hughey over at shortstop. But in the end, all for naught. And we will have a pinch runner for Suffolk as Zach Grogan will come on in, sophomore from Morristown, New Jersey. So Grogan, the pinch runner for Coyley. So the left fielder and three-hole hitter and the only player hitting over 400 coming in for these Rams is out of the game as there's a pickoff move from Kaufman, not in time. Matt Brenner is the batter. The backstop is 0 for 3. Reached on an error and grounded out and popped out. From the stretch, Kaufman takes a look over at Grogan. Comes home, and that one is right down Broadway. Nothing in one. Greg Speliotis is on deck for the Rams with nobody out here in inning number seven. Kaufman, quick pickoff move to first, not in time. Beacons trailing three to nothing. Top half of the seventh inning as the 0-1 pitch. Ground ball third base side. Hugh, excuse me. Boudreaux tries to get two. Gets the run at first and then gets the play at first as that is a 5-4-3 twin killing from Kyle Boudreaux and a beautiful turn by Eddie Riley with the runner bearing down on him. And that's two for the price of one. Two down here in the seventh inning. Yeah, and Eddie paid the price for it. He got taken out a little bit. Yeah, that's going to hurt in the morning. Speliotis steps in. He is 0 for 3. A couple of ground outs as this first pitch probably would have been a strike if Searles caught it. It nips off his glove, so it's ball one. Beacons trying to get us to stretch time here with the score still 3-0. Kaufman nips the outside corner. One ball and one strike to Speliotis. The opposing counterpart, Ryan Portis, mowing down Beacons. Meanwhile, Fernando Burgos went five and two-thirds. This one missing inside. Allowed three runs. Just two of them earned. And struck out three as well. It's two balls and two strikes as Kaufman's able to get things even here with two outs in the top half of the seventh inning. From the windup, the 2-2 two -two pitch, just a bit low, three balls and two strikes. These Suffolk hitters continue to not swing at balls out of the strike zone. It's pretty impressive. Somebody with an ice cream cone here, Steve, out there in the elements. And I'm more impressed by that than anything I've seen on the diamond so far. As that one misses outside, check swing. Anthony wants an appeal, gets it, and does not get the call. It's ball four. No, I'd eat anything right about now. <laughs> you just said off the air, I can't wait to order a pizza later, so I would imagine. Just got a whole pantry still open. By the time this one ends, eh, not looking good. 
destroying my hopes and gene dreams is John over here. I know the feeling. As we'll have a pinch runner here. And it's going to be B.J. Neal, the native of Linfield, and a senior. So with two down, Neal will come in for Speliotis. UMass Boston trailing three to nothing. Two outs here in the top half of the seventh inning. With B.J. Neal now at first, Luke Ronke will step in. Luke's 0 for 2 with a walk. As that one is a two-seamer on the inside corner. Nothing in one. Three runs on six hits. No errors for Suffolk. Meanwhile, for the Beacons, no runs, one hit, and three errors. As there's a pickoff move not in time. Beacon scheduled to be right back at it tomorrow against Worcester State. That one a road game. Kaufman from the stretch takes a peek, fires home, ground ball foul, nothing in two. Got to be careful tomorrow because it's supposed to be real rainy up here in Boston. I don't know what the what the weather's going to be like in Worcester, but you assume they're going to get some rain as well. Yeah, it's been the uh, the season for it. April showers bring May flowers, they always say. Up here, it's April snow brings more snow as this 0-2 pitch is in the dirt. Good block from Searles, and he would have had the man dead to rights, but he double-clutched, and that'll allow B.J. Neal to advance to second. So that's a wild pitch for Kaufman, and that puts a man in scoring position with two down. So, John, what brings 70 degrees? Moving. No, July maybe. Although we had, supposedly next week we're supposed to have a really nice week. So uh, we'll hope that does come to fruition as this one is foul off the third base coach's cleat. We had a, this stretch of about a week where it was beautiful or maybe a couple of days, and then it went right back to being New England. For some reason... Mother Nature loves to be as bipolar as possible up here in the Northeast. Whether that be climate change, global warming, whatever you want to call it, or just a natural effect, I'm no scientist. I just play one on TV. Here's a 1-2 from Brian Kaufman as he'll try to get out of this one unscathed. Chop foul. Ronke stays alive. Steve, you have the most like vociferous vibration from your phone. That thing comes out at you like nothing I've ever heard before. Vociferous. That's a SAT word for you guys right there. 1350 back on the old one. Thank you. Here's a 1-2. Well, now they're up to 2400, so you say that, and all the youngins are like, oh, that's not very good. Here's a 1-2. Ground ball, shortstop, cut off there by Boudreaux. Kyle fires across the diamond to Fowler to retire the side. So 5-3 on the put out, and the Eagles, or the Beacons, are out of this one unscathed. We head to stretch time here from Monin Park. It's still 3-0 Rams on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Something I discovered to myself is that if I have a goal, then I can accomplish it. It's a well-rounded experience. At a Division III school, you primarily a student athlete, so the school is really shaped around you developing yourself as a complete individual. It helps a lot that you have a family with your team that can guide you. I'm the first undergraduate alumnus to uh, lead this university. I'm very proud of that. I was literally able to transform my life because of the University of Massachusetts, and I want that for every single student that walks through the door.
That man has been absolutely outstanding today, Ryan Portis. He has allowed just one hit through six innings, and he'll look to continue his dominance on the mound here as we get set for the bottom of the seventh. Beacons will come on out here and counter with 3-4-5, beginning with Dan Mantoni. The new left fielder is Zach Rogan. He came in for Coily on the base pads. He'll stay out there here for the bottom of the seventh inning in left. Only 65 pitches, is that correct so far? That is, yep. So Portis could be looking at the distance this evening if the trends continue as Dan Mantoni, the only man to get a hit off of him, he's one for two, steps in. Launches one into the night, but that's going to go foul and out of play. That would have been gone if fair. Sadly, Dan out in front of that one. It's nothing in one. One good sign for the Beacons is they haven't struck out since the, since the second inning. You know, it was five and two innings, but they've turned it around the second time through the order, and let's see if uh, they can string a couple hits together the third time through. Positivity from Steve Consiglio, a rare trait as we uh, see down 3 nothing. Here's the 0-1. Curveball outside, 1-1. One one. Glass half full, John, glass half full. Oh, man, we have fun on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Meanwhile, the Beacons will try to have fun here with the bat. Here's a 1-1. Another curveball. Dan launches deep left center field. On his horse out there is Chance. Slides down to make a nice play against the grass. Well, when it's not going well for you, it just continues to tumble as Dan Mantoni lines it to left center, but a good play from Chant, who continues to excel. It's one down. That was another case where it seemed like that one was hit harder than it actually was. As Kyle Boudreaux steps in. The third baseman, number 15, Kyle Boudreaux. Boudreaux is 0 for 2, fouled out and flew out. Portis' first pitch, fastball right down the middle, nothing in one. It's 3-0 Suffolk along with Steve Consiglio. I'm John Scudris. This is the Beacons Broadcasting Network. The 0-1 pitch to Boudreaux way outside, 1-1. One one. Beautiful Mountain Park is the setting for this affair. Beacons opening this ballpark that they share with BC High last year in 2016 as this is fouled off the screen, 1-2. Prior to that, the trips to Campanelli Field in Brockton, while a nice venue for baseball, was certainly not ideal. Home game away is what we used to call it. Yeah, I mean, fans wouldn't certainly not be able to make the uh, the trip up there. This stadium being on campus, much more advantageous for the students to come out as Boudreaux grounds it to second. Almost playing him in a shift out there at third base as Higgins, or rather at second as Higgins fires to first to retire him. Two down on a 4-3 put out. And not the way you want to get Chris Fowler up. Nobody on. Fowler, a rare offer so far, nothing in two. He's uh, struck out and grounded out. Portis from the windup. First pitch comes again with that first pitch curveball to Fowler and gets it, nothing in one. Seven consecutive retired here for Portis. And 19 of his last 20, as this one misses outside, one and one. I'd like to see Fowler just try and get something up the middle. There's a huge hole between the shortstop and second baseman. You can see there on your screen. But uh, hopefully he doesn't get pull happy. One, one, skied into center field. Chant to his right and in. And he'll make the play. And the Beacons go quietly yet again here in the seventh inning. One, two, three, go the Beacons. We head to the eighth inning. Only six outs to go for a rally to get started. It's 3 nothing Rams on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. I did receive a non-athletic scholarship upon entering uh, school. I got the presidential scholarship, which was huge for me. I think there's more opportunities for academic scholarships in Division Three. I did receive academic scholarships just being involved on campus. 
being a leader. All those things combined kind of get me recognized. It's a great experience for me. Cheer for the stumbles. Top of the eighth inning here for Monon Park in Boston, Massachusetts. UMass Boston trailing three to nothing. On the Beacons Broadcasting Network, Steve Consiglio along with myself, John Scudris. It will be 7-8-9. Kevin Belsky, Curtis Tyrone, and Kevin Higgins do up as Brian Kaufman will remain out there for his second full inning of relief work. There is some long tossing going on in the Suffolk pen, but nobody really active and for no reason. Portis has been brilliant. He's in the 70s in pitches and should certainly be headed back out there for the eighth. So as Kaufman continues his warm-ups, it'll be Belsky, Tyrone, and Higgins who are excelling this evening, the bottom of the order. Yeah, just keep getting on base, John. They are a combined two for five with two runs scored. Yeah, they also have, uh, what is it, two walks between each other? Yep, as Tyrone's walked twice, also reached on an error. So they've reached base five times in nine at-bats. Higgins got the lone RBI between them three. Six times, actually, in nine at-bats. And, yes, Kevin did get the RBI back in the fourth inning. So here's Belsky, who's two for three, singled twice, scored a run, and grounded out. As Kaufman is ready to go from the windup, gets his sign. And the first pitch from Bryan is off the outside corner, one ball and no strikes. Left-handed hitter Kevin Belsky waits. The 1-0 from Kaufman. And the Rhode Island native sees Belsky ground this one to shortstop. Hugie gobbles it up, fires across the diamond. And there's one down here in the top half of the eighth inning. That'll bring up Tyrone. The third baseman, number one, Curtis Tyrone. And the native of Waltham is 0 for 1. He's walked twice and reached on an error. So he's been on base all three times. He's stepped up to the plate. He's also scored a run. From the windup, Kaufman sees Tyrone chop it foul back to the screen. Nothing in one. Hello. Nothing in one as Kaufman winds. The 0 1 pitch, that one grounded foul. After Tyrone, it will be Higgins and then the top of the order. Kaufman gets the sign from Searles. The 0-2 pitch. Just a bit outside. It's 1-2. It's a good pitch. He's probably setting up the change up or slider down. Maybe back foot the slider inside or keep that change up away in that same spot. The 1-2 the pitch launched right field. That's trouble. That's extra bases. This hot one hops off the fence. Motoring into second is Tyrone. He'll park it there with one down. And so it is the second extra base hit of the evening. And first since the very first batter of the game when Brady Chan hit a triple. And that is a one-out base runner for Kevin Higgins. That was a change up there that, that Tyrone was able to get out in front of and go get. It was a little bit low, but not low enough. Didn't bury it. Kaufman didn't. And he was able to pull it down the line for a double. So now with one down and Higgins stepping on up, Kaufman will tow the rubber from the stretch. First pitch to the nine hole hitters. Fouled right back against the screen. Nothing in one. Yeah. 
The Little East Conference scoreboard. Get you updates in a moment. As here's an 0-1 and a good pickoff move, but Yugi kicking himself there as he was running away from the base pass, just like Tyrone. Eastern Connecticut triumphant over Bridgewater State this evening, 8-5. And UMass Dartmouth, the Corsairs, pounding Salve Regina 10-4. Those are the two finals from the Little East Conference. As another pickoff move is not in time. Albertus Magnus was set to host Plymouth State. That one canceled, as was Western New England against Keene State. As uh, the struggles continue to get games in here this month. Rhode Island College also in a rescheduled matchup lost 8-4 to four to Elms. So not a good night for the Little East Conference, and it's continuing here from Monon Park. Beacons just one hit this evening. They trail three to nothing here in the top half of the eighth inning. Here's the 0-1 pitch. Ground ball foul. Nothing in two. A cold evening in Boston, Massachusetts as we move through the early part of April. The calendar says it's spring. Mother Nature hasn't figured that out yet. The 0-2. Ripped to right field as Brown came in, then has to move back. He makes the catch. Tagging up and moonwalking his way over to third base is Tyrone. And with two down, that will put a insurance run 90 feet away. That will also bring up the top of the order and the team's best hitter, Brady Chant. Yeah, you got to be thinking about pitching around Chant here. He's just he's seen the ball way too well. You don't want to and you don't want to let him make this a four nothing game. The center fielder number four, Brady Chant. Yep. Chant is going to get intentionally walked for the second time. Last time it was after he fell behind three nothing traditionally, and then they just put him on. <laughs> that one almost got away. You see that often. And actually, they just changed the rule, I believe, in Major League Baseball, where they're just going to give him the the walk. Yeah, it's it's too bad. I think it's one thing that doesn't really, it's not a big deal when you're changing, or excuse me, to change. There's a couple guys in the bigs that still can't throw an intentional walk, and Dylan Batanz is the big one because he's one of the best relievers in the MLB, but he's, he threw three wild pitches last year, and one ended up being a walk-off on an intentional walk. And I think that's the little things that change the game. I mean, if you could think back to when Randy Johnson was pitching, he went, he got ahead 0-2 on a guy, and then the runner on first stole second, so they, they decided to intentionally walk the guy, threw three balls, and the catcher for the fourth pitch, or for the, the sixth pitch of the at-bat, just kind of squatted down. He threw a fastball down the middle, and he struck, out, struck the guy out looking. You know, it's the small things. And I think that's something that makes baseball great is those things. And I hate that rule change. I think it's a rule change to appeal to a generation that can't keep their attention on one thing for more than five minutes. But again, I'm not hating on you. It's my generation. Meanwhile, John. meanwhile, Steve Consiglio is going between this game, that game, this game, that game. <laughs> so maybe I am going against you. Nonetheless, runners are at the corners with two down for Sean Cameron. And they fake the third, look to first, is uh, all for naught. The sitting began with a Balski ground out to shortstop, then a double from Tyrone and a, a fly out by Higgins. The intentional walk to Brady Chant puts runners at the corners for Sean Cameron, who is 0 for 4. That one in the dirt. Good block from Anthony Searles as Tyrone's certainly thinking of coming home for the fourth run. I don't think that ball's round enough, John. Kaufman has to switch it out. Kaufman came in back in the sixth inning when it looked like that Fernando Burgos was going to get through that sixth, but an error by Fraschino in center caused some trouble the Beacons were able to get out of as that misses down and in 2-0. 
Kaufman came in after a single by Kevin Higgins, the one batter later. Ended up intentionally walking Chant and then striking out Cameron. And since then, he got out of some trouble back in the seventh and now is trying to get out of it in the eighth. Here's a 2 0. Inside corner, 2 and 1. Beacons trail 3 0 here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. The runner at third, Tyrone. The runner at first, Brady Chant. And here's a 2-1 from Kaufman to Cameron. That one's low. Three balls and one strike to the Rams shortstop. Well, you could think about walking him here because you've got Grogan behind him, who's not the typical DH because Coily came out for Grogan as a pinch runner. It's a good call. As a pickoff move to first is not in time. Grogan is in the on-deck circle. And on the season, Grogan is hitting just 243. Compared to 407, which is what Coily was hitting coming in to starter. As that misses in for ball four. It is the second walk of the inning, the fourth walk overall for Kaufman. And they are going to call on a pinch hitter here. So Grogan will not be the one to face him. It'll be Connor Troyo, a freshman from Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. The six foot three, 170 pound left handed hitter is hitting 333, two for six, with a triple and a run score. So Troyo will be the pinch hitter, left-hander with that wide base on that stance. He waves the bat in front of his helmet. Kaufman with the bases full of Rams. First pitch to Troyo on the outside corner. Connor didn't like it. It's nothing in one. Base is loaded. 3-0 game. Troyo can blow this one wide open with a base hit here. Here's the 0-1. Outside, one ball and one strike. Runner at third is Tyrone. The runner at second, Chant. The runner at first, Cameron. Good wheels on the base pass. Both Chant and Cameron lead their teams respectively in stolen bases. As This one is a timeout called by Troyo. They both have five. So anything in the gaps, we could be looking at a six-run deficit. Here's the 1-1 pitch coming from Kaufman. Line foul out of play. One ball and two strikes, so a huge pitch coming up here for Kaufman. Who will try to tiptoe out of danger here in the eighth inning. Timeout called by Troyo at the dish. Kaufman up to 40 pitchers, pitches, and as a reliever, this might be his last inning. From the stretch, the one-two pitch. Rip foul as that one was a scorcher. Off the screen. Still one ball and two strikes. The freshman Troyo, an alumnus of Shrewsbury High School, along with his teammate Charles Batchelder. Kaufman gets his sign from his battery mate Searles, setting up outside. The one two pitch. Rip to left field, that's trouble. Looping fast and a great diving play made by Nick Herzog as he saves at least one, probably two, and maybe three runs with a great, fantastic diving effort in left field. 
So Herzog delivers for his pitcher, Brian Kaufman. And the Beacons remain in this one through seven and a half. We go to the bottom of the seventh inning. You're rather the bottom of the eighth inning, I should say. It's 3 0 Suffolk on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Moving from Turkey, it was a rough journey for me because when you don't really speak the language that well and when you don't really fit in the crowd, it's very easy to disappear. But I decided not to give up, so. And you must help me. <laughs> So Ryan Portis will look to work into the eighth inning this evening as he has allowed just one hit through the first seven. And the new left fielder is number eight, Zach Aresti, the freshman from Wayland, Massachusetts and Worcester Academy. So Aresti is the new left fielder. They've got four players in that three-hole spot in this game. The Red Sox are heading into extras, John. So Chris Sale's debut, he didn't give up a run. It's 0-0. Eight hits combined between the two teams from Fenway Park, just up the road. Here from Monin Park, the Beacons will send out Danny Brown. And he'll make his first at bat, believe it or not. The Beacons have been so futile at the dish that Danny Brown, who came in way back in the fifth, will make his first at bat here in the eighth. Portis from the windup, and the first pitch misses away, 1-0. Danny Brown is the right fielder. In for Ryan McCormick, who was hit by a pitch back in the fifth inning and left the game due to that. As that one's right down Broadway, it is one and one. Brown on the campaign, 286, two for seven. Driven in two runs and an on-base percentage of 286 as well. Here's a 1-1, one -one, ripped up the line, but foul. They are guarding the lines up the first baseline, not so much on the third baseline. All these left-handed batters, John, are be being played almost a shift, definitely to pull, but the, the shortstop isn't shifting towards the middle. You know, there's a big, big hole up the middle, and kind of setting the beacon's hitters haven't taken advantage of it. Here's the one-two. That's in the dirt. You said it. I mean, that's a chasm if I've ever seen it up the middle, and you hit it anywhere within 15 feet of the bag on the right side, and, and you're golden, but... Sound strategy for Suffolk because the Beacons have hit it right into the shift numerous times. Here's a 2-2 from Portis, and Brown rips it foul out of play. Up the first baseline, it stays two balls and two strikes. Three nothing Suffolk, along with Steve Consiglio. I'm John Scudras here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. As Ryan Portis from the windup will deliver inside just a bit, as it's three balls and two strikes to Danny Brown. We are in the bottom half of the eighth inning. Six outs left for the Beacons to try to. Finagle a comeback here, and a timeout is called by the catcher. That is Brenner, and they call timeout again. He's getting 
Signals in from the dugout. Looks like they're all set to go now. Big 3-2 pitch here. From the windup, the 3-2 back up the middle. That's trouble coming on over and unable to get it out of his glove is the shortstop Cameron double clutching on that one. It's an infield single for Danny Brown. And the Beacons have a leadoff base runner here in the eighth inning. Even though it didn't get through, John, I, he's still using the middle of the field and he's able to beat it out. Danny Brown's pretty fast, and he showed off his speed right there. Absolutely. A sitting from the left side can help, and now we'll have a meeting on the mound. As we'll see how long they allow Portis to tailor his craft out here. It's 3-0 Beacons in the eighth inning. With nobody out and a man on first base, Anthony Searles is the batter. And he's discussing things with Coach Igerbro. Beacon's down 3 nothing, so a sacrifice seems unlikely. But with the way Anthony's been hitting, maybe a hit and run. Portis is only at 83 pitches, but their bullpen is, is stirring. There is somebody throwing, a big righty is throwing out there. So Portis could have, you know, could be out of the same... It, could come out if he gives up a, a hit or two uh, right here. After Searles, Sal Fraschino is due up, but it looks like he will not bat. Luke, as in the on-deck circle. Luke Nagel. Is Luke Nagel, and that's a name that we haven't heard much this year, but we heard a lot in the past. Yeah, my, my junior year, the year he transferred in, I thought he was the best thing that ever happened to us after uh, his Florida trip. He hit 603 bombs. He, he was hitting lasers all year. It's 1-0 and now to Searles with Nagel in the on-deck circle to pinch hit for Fresino. He would represent the tying run if Searles can get on deck, or on base, rather, as the 1-0 is ripped up the line, but foul. There is plenty of action in the Suffolk bullpen. However, like Steve said, just 85 pitches so far. The pitcher warming up is the senior Chuck Gibson, as this one misses outside 2-1. and one. Right-handed pitcher. So now with the runner at first base, Brown, a 2-1 pitch coming on up here to Searles. Curve ball, and Anthony lifts it to right field. In his tracks and to his right to make the play is the right fielder, Ronke, and there's one down in the eighth inning. And so Luke Nagel pinch hitting for Sal Pacino. Getting an opportunity to swing the stick from the left side. The Beacons down three zip. Nagel on the campaign, obviously played sparingly, one for seven. He has an RBI and a run scored as well. So Nagel is in. The runner at first is Brown, one down. Beacons have just two hits today, one back in the first inning, and Brown's infield single just moments ago against Ryan Portis. From the stretch, something he hasn't done much today, Portis hits the outside corner, nothing in one. Nagel, a left-handed hitter against Portis, who has yet to allow a run this evening. Here's the 0-1 curveball high, 1-1. One and, one. and Steve saw that high hanging curve and saw red meat. Yeah, it was too high. It was up around his shoulders. No way he gets a barrel on that. 1-1 one, one coming up to Luke Nagel. From Portis, outside, oh my 
goodness, outside corner. It spans here in the eighth inning. It's one and two. Nagel's upset with that call. I'm upset with that call. <laughs> Safe to say the only ones not are the Rams. Here's a one-two pitch. Just a bit low, two and two. With uh, a victory this evening, Suffolk would improve to 500 at 6-6. Six and six. Beacon still hoping for a comeback to improve to 11-5. and five. Takes a peek at Brown, does Portis, and rocks and delivers. Right down the middle with a curveball, called strike three. He struck him out. That is the second out of the inning and the sixth strikeout. However, it is the first K since all the way back in the second inning. Two down. That brings up Eddie Riley. Eddie is 0 for 1. He flew out to center in his only time up since coming in for Josh Lopez. From the stretch, first pitch to Riley is outside. One ball and no strikes to Eddie Riley, the native of Quincy, Massachusetts. Portis is 1-0 inside, two balls and no strikes. Riley would love to get on base, represent, or bring up rather, the tying run represented by Herzog. Beacon's down 3 nothing, but it could have been a lot worse. They've gotten out of jams left and right when they've been on the uh, fielding end of things. Here's a 2-0 ensuing. It's going to be a high one, I think. Instead, it comes right down Broadway for a strike 2-1. and one. Beacon's, in fact, have had only one 1-2-3 one, inning. It came in the fifth inning against 3-4-5. Meanwhile, for Portis, he has had five one, two, three innings as Brown is back in time on a snap throw. That pitch looked pretty good there, John, but uh, the umpire called it a ball. Well, we'll see if he did. A little bit of a discussion here now. And they were just appealing to second, but they will say Eddie held up. It's three and one. So now with the count, three and one. Big pitch coming up here for Portis. Doesn't want to walk the tying run to the plate. Three one. Taking a mighty hack at that one was Riley, but he rips it foul. That was ball four two, John. Now we'll see whether or not Eddie can keep this one alive. The runner Brown will be off with the pitch with a three two count and two outs. Portis gets the sign he likes. Maybe not, as he does step off. You look at the Beacon's line score, it's not pretty. Three errors, just two hits and no runs. Now Portis is ready. Here's a 3-2 pitch. Ripped into right center field. That's trouble. Coming on in. Will not get there is Chant. A great piece of hitting from Riley, and with the runner Brown off on the pitch, he advances to third, and the Beacons are brewing something here in the eighth inning as Herzog will step up, representing the tying run. You know, Eddie really shortened his swing there, didn't try and do too much. He got a 3-2 change up right there, and he just snuck it right through the middle. Luckily, there wasn't enough air, air underneath it for Chant to, to make the play. Chance got wheels and range out there as well. That's why I was a little concerned. But now Nick Herzog, who is 0 for 3. He's flown out twice and struck out. However, Nick does have a home run this year to go along with a team leading 13 runs batted in. The left fielder, number 34, Nick Herzog. So the team leader in ribbies is in to the right-handed batter's box against Portis. The first pitch is a curve ball, ground ball right back to the mound. Portis gobbles it up, flips to first, and the inning 
is over. 1-3 on the put out and the Beacons threaten. However, no runs on two hits and two men left on base. We head to the ninth inning. It's 3-0 Rams on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. The University of Massachusetts Boston, with its scenic oceanfront campus, easily accessible to downtown Boston, is recognized as a model of excellence for urban public universities. 16 NCAA Division III sports are part of the more than 100 student organizations that create an engaging campus life in America's biggest and best college town. UMass Boston, Boston's urban public research university for the 21st century. A couple of changes for Brett and Agerbrot's Beacons. UMass Boston sees a new pitcher on the mound. It's number 30, the freshman from Marshfield, Massachusetts, Chris Monroe. And the new center fielder will be number 9, the freshman from Dighton, Massachusetts, Joey Rogers. Dighton, Massachusetts. Never heard of it. Never heard of it either. I was hoping you did. Regardless, that is where Joey Rogers hails from, so we'll have to ask him sometime. Chris Monroe from Marshfield is the new pitcher, and what should we expect here from Chris? The team's down 3-0, and he has to face off against the heart of the order, beginning with the cleanup hitter, Brenner, so he's going to have his work cut out for him. His curveball is his strikeout pitch. You know, it's real devastating, just drops off the table. His fastball sits around 83-85, to 85, so you never know what to expect as a batter. Monroe making his sixth appearance. He's got a 3.86 ERA in seven innings. Seven hits, three earned runs, nine strikeouts, and only one walk. So his command has been solid. A freshman from Marshfield, a right-hander standing 5'8", 180. First pitch here to Brenner is inside, 1-0. and In the ninth, in the bottom of the ninth, that is, down by three at least, the Beacons will send 2-3-4, Hughie Mantoni Boudris. So the heart of the order. Here's a 3-0, or rather 1-0, as that one's inside, 2-0. Looking at the scoreboard out there. Three runs on seven hits for Suffolk. No runs on three hits for the Beacons. 2-0 is way outside from Monroe. So right as I say, he's got good command. He fall behind the leadoff hitter, 3-0. After Brenner, DJ Neal is due up. That one's on the outside corner for a strike. From the windup, the 3 0 from Monroe, low, ball four. So a leadoff walk to Matt Brenner. And. That'll bring up Neal. The designated hitter, number three, B.J. Neal. Now, Neal came in for Speliotis earlier on in the game as a pinch runner, so he's not nearly the hitter that, that should be up in this situation. Yeah, he's sitting just 233. does have one extra base hit, 7 of 30 overall. First pitch to him. He looked to bunt, try to get one more insurance run, but that one misses way outside, 1-0. And Anthony Searles is going to go out and discuss things with his battery mate just in case they do decide to follow through on the bunt. And I think they're just going to say swing away to B.J. Neal. At least that's what the arm and my professional lip-reading skills showed me from looking down there at the third base coach, which means he's probably bunting. Beacons down 3 nothing, along with Steve Consiglio. I'm John Scudris. Top half of the ninth inning. B.J. Neal is up. The runner at first base is Matt Brenner. 
Beacons trying to hold this three-run deficit. Here's the 1-0. They are going to sell him to swing away as he takes a cut, or half a cut, rather, holds back 2-0. After BJ, it'll be Ronke and Belsky. There's a 2 0. Right down the heart of the plate, two balls and one strike. Here's the 2 1. In the dirt, good block from Searles, and now it's 3 and 1. So after walking the leadoff hitter, Brenner, Monroe, who came in with only one walk on the year, is now behind 3 and 1 to Neal. Beacon's bullpen remains silent. Monroe has that Craig Kimbrell arm motion out of the stretch. Here's the 3 1. Or somewhere that missed right down the middle for a ball, and it's ball four to put two men on base with nobody out. And that will bring up Luke Ronke, who is 0 for 3, struck out twice, grounded out, and walked. And also get the Beacons bullpen to start throwing. And that might do it for Monroe. No, pitching coach Dan Gamble, he's not making any changes right here. Certainly a big at bat here for Monroe coming up. He walks the first two batters he faces and didn't really attack the hitters much at all. Now he's got to face Ronke who came in hitting 326. They could be bunting here. You know, a five-run five, five lead is a lot different than a three-run lead, especially against this Beacons lineup. Wouldn't be a bad strategy and one we've seen often, but you have to be able to get that bunt down. The Beacons tried to do that against Worcester State. The bunt went right back to the pitcher, and he ended up throwing out the lead runner at third base. So you have to get the bunt down the third base line or at the very least, one of the lines. And I'm not adept or sure how adept Luke Ronke is at bunting, but as a right fielder hitting 326, I wouldn't necessarily think it's his forte. Runners at first and second. They are squaring around, and Ronke gets it down. Monroe had to play at third if he wanted it. Instead, he'll go to first base and get the shore out. Runners advance to second and third, and that's probably the right play. Yeah, the play they put on there, they weren't trying to get the runner at third. They were just trying to get an out. So one four put out on the sacrifice bunt. The runners advance to second and third with only one out, and that'll bring up Kevin Belsky. Belsky is two for four, singled twice, grounded out twice, and scored. And that one is outside. Actually, this is going to be a pinch hitter. Excuse me. Uh, this is Trevor Lee, sophomore from Flanders, New Jersey. So it's 0-1 to Trevor Lee, and on the outside corner, nothing in two. There's that good curveball that he backdoored right there, John. Lee is 3 for 19, good for 158 on the year. We'll see if Monroe can deliver a big strikeout here. The infield is in to protect against that fourth run as a breaking ball dips outside, 1-2. and two. Monroe working from the windup with runners at second and third. The one-two pitch outside, and Searles had to pop out of his stance to protect there. Searles heading out to discuss things with Monroe here. The count now 2-2 two -two to Trevor Lee, the pinch hitter. Runner at third base is Brenner. The runner at second, B.J. Neal. One down after the sacrifice by Ronke. Here's the 2-2. Two -two. 
in the dirt, and another three-ball count for Monroe. Three of his first four batters he faced has gone that deep. He's walked two of them. Wouldn't be the worst situation for a walk here, since you do set up double play, at least a force at home. There's a 3-2 curveball, fouled out of play. Just be a waste, because you got to add nothing in two. You know, it'd be, should have went up upstairs with a fastball, see if you can get the batter to chase, versus going way outside with a curveball and the, nothing, uh, nothing the batter chased. Here's a 3-2 pitch, down low, ball four. The third walk of the inning for Monroe, and the bases are full of Rams with only one out. The third baseman, number one, no Curtis Tyrone. And that will bring up Tyrone, who's heated up today. He's one for two, but he's been on base all four times he's been up. He's walked twice, he reached on an error, and he doubled. He has scored once and been stranded at third twice. So we'll see if that success continues as the Castle's beginning to tumble down around Monroe here in the ninth inning. The curveball low, ball one. Nowhere to put Tyrone after three walks here in the ninth inning from Monroe. Here's a 1-0 pitch. Ground ball to second base. Gobbled up Riley, comes home with it, gets the force there. Searles back to first, not in time, but a good play by Eddie Riley, call it 4-2 on the putout. And that's two down here in the ninth inning. Even better play by Fowler. That, uh, that throw from Searles was, was almost behind the runner. He reached around and, and caught the ball somehow. So that brings up Kevin Higgins, who is one for four, singled back in the sixth inning, and a big at bat here with the bases still loaded. First pitch to Higgins, curveball, beauty of a curveball, nothing in one. Beacon's outfield is playing ridiculously shallow right now. Not, re not much respect for the power of the hitter. Higgins, 2-12 on the year, no home runs coming in. The 0-1, grounded foul, and now Monroe is one strike away from really getting himself out of a jam. Three walks in the inning, but he's able to get the sacrifice bunt for one out, and then the ground out to second base on the force out at home. And now he's one strike away if he can get Higgins here, keeping the Beacons in it. From the windup, Monroe. The 0-2 pitch. Curveball, ground ball, softly hit. Boudreaux cuts it off, fires across the diamond to get him and retire the side. So despite three walks, the Rams come up empty in the top half of the ninth inning. Last chance for romance coming up here for UMass Boston. They trail 3-0 on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Division 3 allows you to give yourself to other things. Having that free time allows me to pursue the things that I want to pursue. Division 3 athletics affords students the opportunity to you know, engage in the other interests in their campus and in their lives outside of that sport. It allows you to just be able to do everything you want to do. How it wouldn't change it for the world. So with the bottom of the ninth about to convene, it is a new pitcher. And the first time we'll see a new pitcher here for these Rams of Suffolk as number nine, Chuck Gibson, the senior right-hander from Malden, Massachusetts, will try to close this one out and earn himself a save. Chuck on the year, get his numbers, 2-0. This will be his fourth appearance, starter by trade. 2.04 ERA in 17 and two thirds. He's given up 17 hits and four earned runs, striking out nine and walking six. 
Trevor Lee also stays in. He was at first base. Or rather, he pinch hit a last inning for the first baseman and will stay in. That was Kevin Belsky. Ten fifteen here on the East Coast as this game approaching three hours. Baseball is really the one sport. Unlike all the other sports, when you are in a college atmosphere like this where there aren't TV timeouts and things like that, they're usually more abbreviated than they are when they're professionally and they're done on uh, you know, the normal airwaves. Baseball, not so much because you're going to have those warm-ups between innings every time, and so it's going to drag to about three hours no matter what you get. Yeah, they're almost a little longer in college because the command of the pitchers isn't as good and there tends to be more walks. Charlie Hugie will tr perhaps try to work a walk himself. He is 0 for 3. Pulls back on a fake bunt. Nothing in one, as that one's a called strike. Charlie struck out in the first. He's since grounded out twice. He has not batted since the sixth inning, as the Beacons continue to be mired in futility at the dish this evening. And now the discussion between Gibson and Brenner will cause a stoppage in play. So the Beacons trailing 3 nothing. bottom half of the ninth inning. They'll need a rally of sorts to try to get back in this one. Just three hits overall today. They have just as many errors as they do hits. Brenner back behind home plate. Hugie is ready, as is Gibson. And Chuck with the 0-1 pitch. Fast ball on the outside corner, says the umpire. Nothing in two. After Charlie, it'll be Dan Mantoni and Kyle Boudreaux. Beacons will hope to get Chris Fowler up. Here's the 0-2. Way outside in the dirt. One ball and two strikes. That slider just kept sliding, John. Wasn't even close. I mean, kind of bought... Charlie Hugie a ball there. Easy one to lay off, but you got to watch out for an inside fastball right here or another slider down and away. Gibson ready from the windup. The one two pitch comes back with a two seam fastball, cuts over the outside corner for strike three. That strike zone just keeps getting bigger. Apparently, maybe the home plate umpire is hungry as well. That's one down here in the ninth inning. Dan Mantoni steps up. He's one for three. He's the only beacon with an extra base hit. As that came all the way back in the first inning. Since then, he's grounded out and flown out. Gibson from the windup. And the first pitch to Dan is right down the heart of the plate. Nothing in one. Difference between the pitching staff so far. You can't say that the pitchers for the Beacons did exceedingly poorly, but just <coughs> command issues. The Suffolk staff, which of course really was Portis for the majority of this game, but Gibson now, they've been much more succinct in hitting the strike zone on a consistent basis, and that's the difference defensively at the very least. The Beacons struggled with the glove and, of course, with the stick. So this game could be a lot different uh, and more of an advantage for Suffolk. Then just 3 nothing. Here's an 0-2 to Dan Mantoni, and that's missed that's somewhere. Same pitch to Hugie. <laughs> One ball and two strikes. You can tell you're a pitcher, Steve. Yep. Got to be consistent as an umpire. I don't care where the strike zone is, but you got to be consistent. Chuck Gibson with one down. Here's the 1-2 to Dan Mantoni. Not even close. Two balls and two strikes. Kyle Boudreaux is on deck. He is 0 for 3. Fowler in the hole. He is also 0 for 3. Here's the 2-2 from Gibson. And that one cuts off back over the inside corner. Dan couldn't believe it. And he strikes out for the first time today. No comment. Back-to-back -back strikeouts looking here in the ninth inning, and the Beacons are down to their final out, and it's Kyle Boudreaux stepping on in. So with two down, the Beacons now have struck out eight times today. 
And Burgess represents the last chance for Romance. The first pitch from Gibson is a bit low, 1-0. Boudreaux with the open stance from the left side. Here's the 1-0 pitch, and that one is just a bit low as well, 2-0. That one looked better than the last one. Began's trying to get base runners here in the bottom of the ninth inning, trailing 3-0. They have been beleaguered by poor at-bats all evening long. Here's the 2-0. Outside corner. That's, That's more outside than the last one. And I think... Boudreaux looked back at the dugout saying, what am I supposed to do? So now the 2-1 pitch coming from Gibson. That's low, 3-1. Chris Fowler is on deck. The man who would represent the first chance at a tying run is Danny Brown. He's in the hole. But with two outs, Beacons just need to get someone on base. Here's a 3-1 from Gibson. Ripped into left center field, moving back. And unable to get there is the new outfielder, Oreski. And that defensive replacement comes back to bite him, as that is a double for the Beacons' third baseman, Kyle Boudris. The second double of the game for the Beacons. And it gives just a sliver of hope to UMass Boston as Fowler will step in. Beacons might get a pinch runner out there, and I think they're going to, but they have to get the man to get his jacket off and out there, as it looks like Danielson will be the man coming on into pinch run. So Lionel with those long strides and great wheels will replace Kyle Boudreaux this evening. Though his run is really elementary. So Chris Fowler steps in. Fowler is 0 for 3, coming off a couple of great performances his last few times out. He struck out, grounded out, and flew out in his first three at-bats. Gibson gets his sign. First pitch to Chris is on the outside corner, I suppose. Nothing in one. Runner at second is Danielson. The batter is Fowler. Beacons down by three. Bottom of the ninth, two outs. The 0-1 pitch. Curveball rip. Base hit to the right side. Danielson is being sent home. He will score. And the shutout is over. And the tying run will step up to the plate. So the RBI streak continues. It's now four games for Chris Fowler and his... Team leading total is now tied with Herzog at 13. Danielson scores the run. And Danny Brown, at least for the moment, is scheduled to bat. We'll see what they do with the tying run here. And Danny Brown not exactly having the most exceptional power. Instead, they're going to do a pinch run at first base for Fowler. And that will be Nick Cotraro, the freshman from Beverly, Massachusetts. And now Danny Brown is going to get a discussion here with Brendan Igerbro. So at the very least, the Beacons have eliminated the shutout. They made it a bit interesting here, set up for some drama against Gibson. And Danny Brown is the tying run with a chance to keep the game alive for Searles, who's on deck and who beat this team with a walk-off the last time they played in March. Just about to bring that up. First pitch to Danny. That's so bad. Is inside, but... Called a strike. It's nothing in one. Not going to get any breaks here from the blue as the Beacons are going to need to swing the sticks. The 0 1 pitch, and that's outside. 1 and 1. My headset would have been through this glass if he called that a strike, too. <laughs> 3 1. <laughs> 3 1 Suffolk. I'm just picturing that now. Two down in the bottom of the ninth inning. Danny Brown swings foul off the screen. The Beacons are down to their final strike. 
And of course, with the way this game has been called, especially late, Danny's going to have to be really protective here. Had a great at bat his last time up, singling to begin the eighth inning. Beacons actually had runners at the corners. Were unable, however, to get anyone home. Gibson gets the sign. The one-two pitch. Curveball called strike three. He struck him out, and the ball game is over. Nine strikeouts overall for the pitching staff of the Suffolk Rams as they mow down the Beacons and win this one by the final score of 3-2-1. So UMass Boston gives up a run in the first inning, two more in the fourth. They were only able to muster any sort of offensive production in the ninth inning, and they fall by the final of 3-1 in this one. Let's wrap things up by taking a look at what's ahead here for UMass Boston. Of what's ahead for UMass Boston. Tomorrow they'll be at Worcester State for a 3 p.m. matchup. We'll see if that one even gets underway due to the inclement weather coming on through. Then they'll be at RIC as the anchor men will host the Beacons for a doubleheader beginning at noon. And I'll be back home next Tuesday, April 11th, against Salem State. Coverage beginning just before 7 p.m. on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Steve, tough loss, 3-1. to one. Have anything you'd like to add here before we do sign off? I mean, it's tough. I mean, you can't, you can't really win a ball game very often scoring one run, but you look at the pitching from the Beacons, and they didn't do well. They walked a total of, what, seven guys again? Yep. Maybe even more? See, six, seven, eight, nine guys today. You're just not going to win a game when you walk that many. But the, uh, the biggest take back is you got to have better at-bats. I mean, Portis threw a hell of a game, and but he, there's no way he should have been out there through eight innings. Suffolk improves to 6-6 six and six overall. The Beacons fall to 10-6 and six on the 2017 campaign. I'd like to thank our production staff, as always. Couldn't do it without them. They continue to brave the elements and give us a... Very, very exceptional broadcast. Our producer, Seth Orensky, our directors, Elizabeth Glavin and Alyssa Fugel. On instant replay as well, Easy e from the volleyball team. Going to miss her next year when she's no longer bringing her talents not only onto the volleyball court. Steve, will miss you too. Don't worry. I didn't get to you yet. Our camera operators, Maddie Byrne, Emily Steinberg, Rachel Myatt, and Eileen She, and of course, my partner in crime, Steve Consiglio. Your Mets still mired in a 1-1 tie. Unfortunately, the Beacons falling by the final score of three to one. For all of those people involved and everybody else paying attention and listening all season long, I am John Scudris. Good night, good luck, and good baseball. We'll see you next time right here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network.